Well, Matthias, I'm showing 11 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time on my computer. And in the spirit of starting three meetings in a row on time, what do you say we kick off? That sounds perfectly fine with me. Uh, welcome everyone to day three of the 2021 uh, FBAR Spring Meeting. Uh, today we have a great lineup again talking for the major focal area on operational airspace capacity estimation and prediction on the convective weather impacts. And after that, a shorter segment uh, by Matt and myself to give you some uh, FPA updates, particularly as it relates to the organizational structure. And uh, since this meeting is held virtually again, uh, please uh, mute your microphones if you are not speaking such that we minimize uh, background noise and can really focus on the speakers. And uh, if you submit your questions or comments via the chat room capability, that would be really nice and has worked well in the past. And we will have uh, Bob Adjun uh, from MITRE uh, monitoring that and bring up these comments and questions at the appropriate time to support uh, the session leads as needed. And as an outlook on May 12, we will have our planning meeting. And if you have some ideas of things you would like to see discussed at future, meeting, at future meetings, please submit your topics via the FPA website. There is an option there to submit topics. And the meeting uh, will be recorded uh, for your information. Anything else, uh, Matt, that I forgot to mention? Back to you. Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so, uh, Matthias. I think you've covered it all. Let, let me just make sure that all of our principals are here. Yes, Lee is here. Good. And I know Greg's here because I've already talked with him. So I think we have the folks on who, uh, who are going to, going to kick off the session. So, um, no, I think I think we're we're ready to ready to go. So uh, let me hand it off at this point to uh, Dr. Li Jang from um, the IMSG Corporation, and uh, with his co-conspirator, Mr. Ernie Stellings from NBAA, they're going to uh, they're going to be running this uh, the first three hours of today's FPA session. So Li, over to you. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt and uh, Matthias. Uh, I'm a. I feel very excited and also challenged <laughs> to uh, put together this session. As we all know of uh, this uh, topic related to airspace cap capacity, uh, has been uh, worked on for probably over two decades. Yet there are still many challenges and so many uh, aspects or facets. So today what we're going to hear uh, uh, presentations from FAA, from airlines, from research labs, and from industry on where we are, uh, what are the issues, what are the challenges, and uh, we do have a, we we did put put together a very strong uh, relevant uh, panel and uh, great uh, presenters to have the uh, content lined up uh, for the audience. And also remember, this is a discussion. We don't want to drive to, to a conclusion, but really want to drive it to a better or in-depth understanding of where we are right now. Hopefully make progressive improvement, taking advantage of the major technology breakthroughs nowadays, high resolution modeling, better uh, observation, uh, data availability, AI, machine learning technology, these things. You probably won't hear them all today, okay? And uh, also to narrow down the uh, focus, we uh, you know uh, put the uh, focus on convective weather related uh, constraint because airspace capacity is, is such a a complicated mess. You know we don't want to bring mountain uh, wave and other icing related stuff uh, to complete the picture, but uh, uh, hopefully the audience will, will get the uh, a great sense. And here, also like to acknowledge my uh, uh, great uh, co-chair, 
Ernie uh, Stellings from NBA, who not only provided a lot of help and contact for these uh, for speakers and the panelists, but also he actually put together a, uh, a white paper for the uh, FE, uh, AA uh, flow evaluation team last year. Uh, had very comprehensive uh, in-depth review on the current technologies. We will hear some of those today. Uh, we actually successfully secured uh, four out of the five groups who uh, presented their approach in that paper. So Ernie will get to the session. Also, uh, I'm very grateful for, for Jim Evans, who actually worked in this area for decades, you know, have a lot of experience and the lessons learned. So this afternoon in part three, he will run the session and talk about the complexity and the risk of challenges. And uh, uh, I'd like to remind that we did plan for uh, time for questions and discussion at the end. However, if you, you know, for after each presentation, if you have quick questions uh, that can be clarified uh, short, you know, very briefly, please feel free to ask. And uh, you know, if not, you know, uh, I I hope we use the time uh, for discussion wisely and uh, get more in-depth uh, discussion today. from the oh. panelists. Okay, all right. Without further ado, I will introduce the uh, first speaker. Is the our uh, <coughs> panelist from uh, FA Command Center, uh, Greg Bias. Greg right now is the manager for CDM and international operations F at the FA Command Center. Uh, he had a lot of experience and served many roles in this area. So uh, in, the, in, the, in the airport website, we do have a list of the uh, bios. So I encourage everyone to take a look at the further background. You know, for the uh, sake of time here, I will not cover the four bios here, but uh, I will hand the uh, a session to Greg to go through his uh, presentation. So Greg, are you ready? Thank you very much, Lee, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, address the group this morning. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. As Lee mentioned, we do want this to be interactive. So uh, while well, we'll allow for questions at the end, if there's something that comes up uh, while I'm talking that you would, would like to, to address at that time, please feel free to use the uh, uh, hand uh, raise feature or uh, however you'd like to uh, to get my attention. Uh, we do want to make this a, a two-way conversation. Uh, I get the benefit of going first and uh, hopefully I, I will set the stage for the rest of the discussion. Uh, I know looking at the rest of the panelists and the other folks that will be uh, presenting information and uh, working with the airlines as well as the uh, individual companies. Uh, we've got a lot of information for you dealing with uh, airspace capacity, uh, looking at airspace flow programs in particular, uh, and how we utilize uh, that tool in managing the, the national airspace system. Uh, so what I'd like to do is, is kind of set the stage with um, some of the background on uh, what we're looking at from the command center's perspective, what we're doing or attempting to do different this year than what we've done in years past. Um, last year, as everyone knows, what was uh, an anomaly as far as um, the, the reduction in volume, uh, the, the need for uh, controlling different airspace issues, even though we had a convective weather season, uh, the volume was such that uh, really didn't have too much impact on the overall system um, with how we managed. Uh, but we had the opportunity during that reduced volume time frame to really look hard at our structures at our strategies of use uh, for different tools uh, to make sure we were being as efficient as possible. So we have spent uh, a lot of effort uh, over the last year working collaboratively with industry uh, in helping us to identify efficiencies that we can gain uh, and take advantage of those efficiencies as we see traffic start to, to increase coming forward. So as we go into the next slide, we'll, we'll talk about uh, some of those outreach that we, we work with on uh, industry. Uh, so the, uh, calling this a strategy of use document, really looking at uh, how we use uh, airspace flow programs to control airspace uh, constraints, primarily due to convective weather. Uh, we do use AFPs uh, during uh, high volume events, uh, particularly uh, during snowbird season with 
uh, traffic from the north going south, uh, particularly on the weekends, uh, needing to control volume. But for the vast majority of AFP usages, uh, we're looking at convective weather uh, and how we're utilizing this tool uh, in weather events. But through this last week, I'm sorry, last year, uh, working with industry, uh, really looking to improve transparency. Uh, so that we're getting the input from all of the NASA users. Uh, we're, looking uh, we're looking at, at different weather scenarios. scenarios. Uh, I'm getting a bit of an echo. All right, seems to have gone away. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of data, so we're looking at historical information, um, pulling that uh, historical data to help us make you know, those future decisions. Uh, if we look at similar weather days or what we did in the past when the weather developed in certain areas uh, and the tools that we utilized uh, in managing that particular day, uh, was it a good outcome? Was it a bad outcome? What lessons can we learn from that? So that our decisions going forward with how we manage the NAS today, it's based on that data uh, and based on as much information as we have from past experience to help us move forward. Um, some of the things we've done already, uh, this month we had a NAS efficiency uh, swap summit for 2021. Uh, it was developed collaboratively and you'll see some of the uh, outcomes from that in the discussions today. Uh, again, looking at strategies for how are we going to work together uh, to manage these airspace constraint issues. Uh, we also have our NAS collaboration forum on a monthly basis. Uh, formerly, uh, we referred to it as our National Customer Forum. Um, we've changed the emphasis, uh, really emphasizing the collaborative aspect of it. Uh, NAS Collaboration Forum captures better what we're trying to accomplish during that monthly engagement. Um, and AFP usage and strategies and how we manage the system are at the forefront of every one of those meetings and providing industry an opportunity uh, to provide that feedback on, again, what, what's working and, and what challenges we have uh, with the way we're managing. Uh, we have had a couple of events already uh, this year that have been impactful. Uh, April 11th in particular uh, had a very significant uh, weather um, formation in Florida uh, that caused a lot of disruption to the system and a lot of impact to the operators. So we're taking a very close look at that event in particular, and actually we'll be briefing the results of that out at um, the, the May uh, NAS collaboration forum. So we move on to the next slide, uh, talk about our communication process. How do we keep this uh, aspect of transparency at the forefront? Uh, I want to talk a little bit about our PERTI or advanced planning process. This is looking at uh, tomorrow's operation today. Uh, let's take a look at what we anticipate tomorrow's operation entailing reference weather. Uh, we spend a lot of effort uh, during today's uh, analysis looking at tomorrow's operation on what is the forecast going to be, uh, what is the confidence for that forecast, uh, what kind of permeability are we expecting throughout the airspace? Uh, looking at any volume issues we may be anticipating, any equipment outages, uh, but really taking that uh, next day planning um, to spend a lot of effort in uh, gathering all that analysis so that in the afternoon today at 2.30 this afternoon, we'll be holding a collaborative uh, webinar with industry uh, to talk about tomorrow's operation. And that takes place every day. And during those discussions, we're talking about uh, the weather forecast, what's anticipated, uh, and what our strategies are for uh, approaching uh, the management of, of that particular day of operation. And then when we get to the actual day of operation, we're looking at what's changed potentially. Uh, has the forecast become more um, solidified or has, has, has more information come in uh, that changes anything? Uh, we're having those telcons uh, every two hours on the day of operation where we have an opportunity to engage with all the stakeholders and all the facilities, get their input, uh, and make adjustments uh, to the plan. We have our collaborative weather products. We're looking at uh, possible ways of, of, again, looking at historical data and doing verification uh, to help us with the uh, accuracy and, and the, the um, ability of those collaborative weather forecasts and, and products to actually help us 
know what's going to happen uh, the day before. Uh, we also have what we call our critical decision window, and this goes into the timing aspect of it. Uh, when do we need to have uh, a program or an initiative uh, in place in order to achieve the outcome uh, that we are looking at based on all the data sources and all the information that's available to us? Um, and again, looking at historical data, we want our decisions to be data based. Um, so with the amount of information we have from the historical archives, uh, being able to determine with some of the tools that are available what a similar day would look like, what initiatives we implemented, uh, and then what the outcome was. How much holding did we have? How many delays? How many diversions? Um, you know, what lessons can we learn from what we did in the past? And then what's going to be our trigger event? Uh, when do we need to implement um, these initiatives? And this goes into the critical decision window aspect as well, making sure that when we implement initiatives, whether it be an AFP or reroutes or ground stops or ground delay programs, um, what's going to be the trigger for us implementing those initiatives and making sure that we're timing that uh, correctly? So as we go on to the next slide, we'll look at what our AFP strategy is looking like. Uh, we want to proactively manage the NAS without over control. Uh, AFPs uh, are rarely used in isolation. Uh, they typically are part of a package of traffic management initiatives. Uh, again, it depends on where the constraint is and what problem we're trying to solve. Uh, if there are close in core airports, uh, there may be airport issues that need to be managed with ground delay programs or ground stops, but then we also may need an airspace flow program to help manage the in route environment. Uh, and it, it, you have to look at are we dealing with a, an in route only airspace constraint, or do we have arrivals and departures uh, and routes associated with those arrivals and departures that will be impacted that we have to take into consideration? Uh, so all of this goes into our advanced planning and then we carry it through to the day of operation. The goal is to maximize throughput. Uh, at times we may look at a strategy of limiting arrivals to make sure that departures have an opportunity to uh, get off the airport and, and avoid gridlock. Uh, we don't want to overemphasize one versus the other. Uh, it's looking at total throughput for the system, uh, balancing that capacity with demand and at the number one forefront, making sure that's a safe environment uh, for the pilots and for the controllers in, in how they're working the aircraft uh, through the systems. Um, there are a lot of tools that are needed and we're getting better with the tools. We'll have some conversations later on this morning and this afternoon about some of the tools that are being developed, um, but being able to um, uh, measure and, and forecast and look at uh, the data that's available to us and the tools that help us to, to make that um, that decision and support that decision uh, are critical to us being successful going forward with this. Uh, and all of our efforts are, are done in collaboration with the flight operators, uh, making sure that we're meeting their needs as well. So on the next slide, as we look at what type of events uh, impact us from an airspace capacity standpoint, uh, basically broken down to you could have a localized event uh, impacts one in route facility. Uh, you may have one or two uh, core airports that underlie that. Uh, but if the airspace uh, that's constrained is relatively small, uh, it's localized. Uh, we have one approach for handling that. So you have one airport or one uh, in route facility that's impacted. Uh, we look to the surrounding facilities to support. Uh, with reroutes, with uh, managing the traffic flows going in there and, and really uh, isolating that one particular area. Uh, but then you might have a more regional approach where the weather's more widespread. Now you're covering um, you know, several in route facilities, maybe two or three that are being impacted, uh, and looking at how are we going to manage that airspace. Uh, and with all of the complexities, now you've got, particularly if it's something on the East Coast, you've got more core airports involved. Uh, you're starting to have to look at um, managing airport operations with ground delay programs and ground stops. Uh, so all of this figures into the planning aspect. Uh, and then we have the, the most significant where it's a NAS wide, uh, where we get the uh, convective weather lines from you know, El Paso, Texas, all the way up to uh, the Canadian border. Uh, it's going to be a very impactful day. Uh, it's going to impact a lot of uh, facilities, 
a lot of aircraft. Um, and each one of those, um, you know, whether it's localized, regional, or NAS wide, takes a little different approach as to how we, we look at the constraint and what we look at trying to manage that. So on the next slide, we'll talk a little about timing. Um, fortunately, with convective activity, it normally um, on the East Coast starts mid-morning or early afternoon. Uh, we can usually get the first bank of East Coast departures airborne and westbound uh, before we get into most of our convective events. Uh, so then we have to start looking at the traffic uh, coming back across the country, uh, coming from the West Coast uh, eastbound. Uh, and making sure that uh, we're utilizing the tools and the, the critical decision window in particular uh, to make sure that we're implementing any initiatives that go into place um, in a timely manner so that the airlines have the opportunities, uh, and not just the airlines, but all the flight operators have the opportunities to adjust uh, their fuel requirements if it's a reroute or um, you know, in any other constraints that they would need to consider. Uh, so we're really looking at about uh, by 1500 uh, Zulu, 1500 UTC, uh, needing to have a decision made on what we're going to do based on the information that we have available to us. Uh, and it's really trying to capture that initial westbound push coming eastbound uh, and then working through the remainder of the day um, as the, the conditions warrant based on what the convective activity is doing. So on the next slide, uh, we'll look a little bit at AFPs in particular. Uh, airspace flow programs, you're looking at uh, basically drawing a line in the sand or putting up a wall in the airspace uh, and being able to control the flow of traffic through that airspace. Um, typically, uh, we have ceilings and floors that we attach uh, to the, the airspace flow program, normally set at <clears throat> excuse me, 60,000 feet or flight level 600 and then all the way down to 12,000 feet. Um, we are looking and working very diligently with the flight operators to determine the areas where we can actually uh, lower the uh, ceiling on some of these AFPs and raise the floor. Uh, it depends a lot on where the location is. Um, looking at spacing and sequencing requirements for uh, airports that might be just on the other side uh, of the AFP line uh, and having to take all of that into consideration. Um, so in, in the past, we, we had been fairly rigid on uh, ceilings and floors being at 60,000 feet and 12,000 feet, but we're seeing an opportunity for us to do uh, some adjustment there in some areas, uh, which helps out the operators and gives us a more option to actually take advantage of some clear air airspace uh, and utilize capabilities that uh, you know, would otherwise be um, available to us but not used. Uh, as we go on to the next slide, talk a little bit more about um, the, the floor aspect. We're looking at uh, making sure that we keep uh, space available uh, for escape routes, for capping, capping, capping and tunneling, sorry. Uh, and again, with the focus on trying to keep a balanced throughput, making sure we have room for the departures to get out of uh, airspace areas that are constrained by convective weather. Uh, so this is another limitation on uh, adjusting the floor. Uh, if we need to be able to control um, the, the rate of traffic coming out of an area, um, keeping that airspace available for uh, those low level routes to, to get the departures out so that we can actually have room for the arrivals coming in. Go on to the next slide. So these are the factors that we consider in determining rate reduction, and I won't go into a lot of detail because we'll have further conversation later on today uh, that will actually look at the capacity numbers and how we have determined uh, what rates to utilize for AFPs. Uh, but just to kind of set the, the foundation uh, and, and give you a tease for what's coming up later, uh, it is not an exact science. Uh, it requires uh, intuitive knowledge. It requires the expertise of both uh, flight operators uh, with, with their folks with uh, uh, operational expertise, but also the command center and TMU traffic managers uh, in knowing uh, what throughput looks like, knowing what uh, a typical clear, a, clear air day would be for capacity going through airspace, and then how much constrained 
that airspace is going to be based on the convective weather. Um, so it can be very subjective. The tools are getting better to help us with this, uh, and you'll see some highlights of that later on today. On the next slide, we'll go a little bit more into looking at determining rates. So we look at location. Uh, again, is it is it just localized? Uh, is it a regional approach? Is it something that's going to impact the entire NAS? Uh, what's the severity of the convective weather? Uh, tops in the coverage? What's the permeability? Uh, when's it going to start? Is it going to be a late night event? Is it going to be a typical, uh, you know, early afternoon to uh, early evening type of uh, convective activity? Um, is it a line of thunderstorms? Is it uh, you know, an air mass that's coming through. All these things need to go into consideration for how we manage the event. And again, we're trying to manage proactively, um, particularly at the beginning of the day, making sure that we're taking the steps to uh, put all the initiatives in place that need to be put in place at the appropriate time without over control, recognizing we will have to adjust uh, as the day matures and, and we go through and actually see how the flights are operating around the systems, uh, but really trying to have that proactive approach. Uh, next slide, please. So we're also looking at other weather impacts. If there's turbulence associated uh, with some of the weather events, uh, any impacts to the airports I mentioned before, uh, if it's close in proximity to some of the core airports, then we're having to look at additional traffic management initiatives. Um, are the high density airways going to be impacted? Uh, if you have one isolated thunderstorm in the northeast and it's over the wrong airway, it can have a tremendous impact. Uh, you can have a, a very large developed storm in the middle of the country uh, and everybody goes around it and there's not much of an impact from a system standpoint. So it all depends on location with where it's at. Um, and as I mentioned before, we're looking at an en route event that is primarily just moving aircraft that uh, are transitioning the airspace, or are we going to have arrivals and departures? Are we going to have aircraft that are changing altitudes and need to take into account uh, all the aspects that go with that? Uh, over the last several years, uh, we have been asked, working with industry, to look at favoring the Northeast and particularly the New York uh, airports. Um, in keeping them flowing. And so that has kind of changed some of our strategies on what the surrounding facilities around New York Center, New York TRACON uh, do to support that effort, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, potentially we are taking delays at other areas or other airports uh, to make sure that the Northeast airports are flowing as uh, efficiently as they can. Uh, again, that was a collaborative decision uh, with industry input. That was their preference. Uh, and even with the reduction this last year uh, of volume in the Northeast in particular, um, it was still a, a focus for industry to make sure that New York was uh, run as efficiently as possible. Uh, we're also looking this year, and we'll talk a little bit later today, about the use of multiple AFPs, um, where typically in the past we would have our historical uh, AFPs set up and they were well defined. Uh, we're looking now at uh, being able to use multiple AFPs in conjunction to where uh, one may be a primary AFP that is the, the primary constrained airspace, um, but then as we're moving aircraft to other uh, sectors or other facilities on the edges of that storm, uh, having a need, <clears throat> having a need to control um, the, the flow of traffic through that airspace as well. So how do these AFPs work together? Uh, how do they complement one another? And how do the flight operators actually maneuver uh, in between the multiple air, um, AFP usage? And then we're looking at other TMIs. Uh, you know, what other needs are, do we have in the system from uh, GDPs or ground stops uh, to impact and control the, the airport? Uh, expected impact from the convective weather. Then on my last slide, uh, just looking at a, a diagram of kind of what, what the thought process is. It starts with the forecast and with the confidence, and this is the next day planning. This is what the Purdy team looks at. Um, are we certain of the forecast, uh, the, the likelihood of uh, the weather developing uh, as it's being presented to us in those briefings and through that analysis? Uh, the day prior to the operation? Um, 
if it's certain, then we start looking at, you know, are we going to have to have other uh, traffic management initiatives, initiatives in uh, conjunction with an AFP? And, you know, is it both an airport and an airspace issue? What kind of supports needed there? Uh, if it's not a certain forecast, if we know the weather is coming, but it's not real certain on the timing or intensity of it, uh, then we have to make sure that we're looking at capturing what's coming off the West Coast uh, early in the morning, uh, making sure that we are not implementing too soon, which would uh, increase the risk of unrecoverable delay, but making sure that we are, uh, if we wait to implement, that we're still looking at what's going to trigger that implementation, looking at the data from the critical decision window on knowing, yes, we need to pull the trigger and implement, or no, we can wait it out. So it just kind of gives you a, a visual idea of, of all the thought processes that go in. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it, it's a very complex uh, challenge for us. Um, looking forward to the conversation throughout the day on uh, different opportunities and strategies that uh, folks have in mind uh, for helping us with this. And uh, really want to emphasize the, the, uh, the work with, with industry, with the flight operators in particular, um, their willingness to come and help us and collaborate with us in how we manage the system. So I will pause there and see if there's any questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Greg. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I'm sure there will be questions at the uh, Q&A session. Next, we'll have a, a presentation from the airlines. We hear about operational scenarios and then the need. It's actually put together by uh, two airlines. We have Tim Nisnik, who is currently serve as director of uh, analyt analytics for Integrated Operation Center at American Airlines. And uh, we also have Bill Tuck uh, right now at uh, Delta Airlines as the uh, general manager of the OCC, uh, air traffic management and the business technology. Also, uh, they are supported by Aaron uh, Kobet, uh, supporting Bill in uh, Delta Airlines. So I'll hand it over to you guys. Great, thanks Lee. Um, did you wanna run the presentation for us or should I uh, share? Uh, Bill, this is Matt. I'm uh, I'm working my way to to get in the presentation. Now, give me one sec. Great, thanks, Matt. I can see it. Well, thanks, Greg, uh, for all of that on AFPs. Uh, you mentioned uh, one of the uh, days that we picked for our case study, uh, eleven. Uh, April uh, 21, just a few weeks ago. Um, we had thought about uh, uh, using uh, a day uh, in the past, you know, from 2019 or 2018 even, and uh, we decided this is fresh on everybody's mind and we have ongoing reviews on this day. So uh, we wanted to set it up and uh, have this for discussion uh, for what the airlines need uh, uh, for weather, uh, mixed with uh, air traffic control uh, uh, constraints. Um, I'll begin uh, by, by setting up the day. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the event was a, a heavy thunderstorm event in Florida. Uh, it was well forecast on the TCF and uh, aviation impact graphics. Uh, low pressure system and associated cold front uh, generated very strong convection across the, uh, across the state with high tops. Um, what the FAA did was uh, start two AFPs. Uh, advance, please. Great. Um, two AFPs. You can see uh, FL1 was set up for the ARs, and uh, FL2 uh, stretched across the Gulf routes all the way across northern Florida all the way out into the ARs, uh, just to the beginning of the ARs. Um, these are quite impactful. They caught uh, a lot of flights. You know, everything going to Jacksonville and, and, uh, and south was affected by the AFP, um, particularly the, you know, hubs for several airlines in, uh, you know, Tampa, Fort Myers. Um, that wasn't enough. Uh, we got, uh, into the AFPs, and it was 
discovered that uh, we still couldn't uh, get traffic in and out of Florida. We, we needed uh, additional uh, Florida ground stops. Uh, so a ground stop advisory was issued that, that pretty much stopped all traffic to and from and through Jacksonville Center. Um, as the convection continued to push south, uh, portions of Jacksonville Center were released, but then Miami Center was ground stopped uh, by advisory, not, not city based, and that'll be important later. Uh, advance, please. I can play you a video. I've got the video here. Let me uh, let me go into sharing. Bill, why don't you drive the rest of the way out? You got it, Matt. I'll go ahead and start the video. You can see the timestamp. Hopefully you can read it if you're on a big enough screen. It's in the upper left hand corner. The video starts at 1330 Z in the morning. And you can see we're already kind of set up uh, poorly on the on the Gulf routes in the in the western half of Florida, and also already have uh, uh, AR impact. Hope it's not too jerky. We're advancing past 15 Zulu now. You see inland is pretty much cut off and we still have problems with the Gulf routes and, and traffic is pretty well dried up. There were several, several hours of ground stop, uh, center based ground stop for this event. This is uh, advancing into 20 Z now and you can see uh, South Florida is uh, really impacted now the, the Miami metros. 22Z, we've got a couple more rounds coming for South Florida. We've got another uh, area just going south of Tampa, and, and I believe there were still thunderstorms in the Miami area with the uh, trailing behind uh, the original line. Two Z now, still not over. We still have another line yet to move through the Miami Center. Almost five Zulu now, and we're still having issues around Metro Miami. <laughs> and that's the end of the video. Matt, do you want to take back control or? Well, you're doing such a great job, Bill. Why don't you just continue on unless you'd like me to? Your call. Well, I'll have to uh, start the PowerPoint now. Hold on a nope. second. Uh, well, I've got it up and running. If you want me to, to go back over to it, I'd be happy to. I, that might be better. Why don't you go ahead and do that, slide four. I, I said I had it open. I, I, I did, kind of, sort of. Bear with me. Okay, next slide, Franzak. I'm not sharing it though, am I? Here we go. Give me a sec. Voila. Tim, over to you for our impacts. All right. Uh, thank you, Bill. So, I mean, as as the video clearly um, showed, that this was a highly impactful day. Um, and as is evident by the statistics and metrics that we're showing here, both between Delta and American, um, significant cancellation event, you know, 200, 300 cancellations over a two-day period for us. Um, you know, tens of thousands of customers impacted. Also significant diversion event, um, as well as gate returns. Um, and all of these are very um, indicative. Um, and then Bill alluded to some of the challenges with that uh, advisory based uh, ground stop and the challenge of some of those edicts and, and some of the technology and automation um, issues we had with that. Um, yeah, um, in 
some of the additional risk factors, on, on, at least on our side, from the American perspective, that made this even more impactful is that, you know, we went into this into this event um, with limited crew availability. Um, all of Florida, especially the Miami area, had very limited to no hotel availability because we were on the um, edge of, of spring break traffic. Um, we also had limited fleet availability. We had 17 aircraft out of service as a result of some of the uh, some of the max grounding. Um, you know, and so then we also had a situation where we didn't have any routes, um, any routes out of out of Florida. And so for us in particular, Miami being a significant connecting hub, we were able to get passengers and flights into Miami. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get them out of Miami. So you had a lot of connecting traffic coming into a hub without the ability to actually connect them out of the hub. So you couple that with the fact that there were no hotels available just resulted in a very challenging day from a customer service perspective. So, um, you know, and even the ability to have limited uh, diversion alternates uh, was challenging. At one point, you know, we had 20 aircraft in holding, all with alternate NASA. Um, and that is not a good situation to be in, you know, uh, for a number of reasons. And so uh, very challenging day. I mean, lots of a very significant impact from our two carriers uh, on this event. And this was not isolated to us. Other carriers had similar levels of impact. Um, but, you know, as we ended up picking this day, I would actually say this is a really good um, representative day from uh, for this discussion for a couple of reasons. One, just the geographic location of this event is meaningful because, um, you know, as, as some people have said, you know, the, the Florida Southeast region is actually becoming the new Northeast corridor, um, you know, especially as COVID recovery is creating extra demand into the Florida region, we're seeing a significant ramp up in traffic going into the Florida Southeast region. And so you, you couple that traffic, that increase in traffic with, with the weather, and you have a significant potential for, for disruptions and impact as weather drives constraints. And so this is a good area of focus for us because we're going to be dealing with this for at least an interim, if not you know several months, as that, that increase in traffic is expected to continue throughout the summer months. And so as we start to pivot now from this impact to what do we want to, and you can go to the next slide um, as we're, we want to have a little bit of a discussion around future needs. And what was also interesting about this particular event is that it was managed with two AFPs. So about two weeks later on the 24th, we had a similar uh, disruption, not quite as intense, but still a significant uh, disruption in this region where we actually employed a three AFP solution where we separated the Gulf from the inland to the ARs um, to try to manage that you know, traffic a little bit more. Um, and there's even been some additional simulation work to even look at splitting that inland AFP into two and east and the west. So all of this suggests that there's uh, the, the future is going to be a little bit more um, adaptive, a little bit more surgical by saying, how can we target these FCAs and these AFPs to better address where and when the constraints are expected to emerge? So having an AFP that governs the Gulf, having one or two that governs the inland, having one that governs the ARs really allows you to be um, much more um, fine-tuned in terms of how do you manage these constraints? Because as you see, the impacts are significant when we have these. So with that, with the ability to do that is one thing, but then comes the challenge of, as you start to get more surgical in these AFPs and FCAs, how do you define the capacities? And that becomes I, really the future of the, you know, where we as airlines see a lot of the um, work is needed and necessary to really get a handle on these. Because even in the 24th, when we had that, those three AFPs, one of the discussions there was, how do we set the rate for that inland AFP? And there was discussions back and forth between 20 to 40 per hour. We landed on 30. That was probably right, but was it what was it really based on the science or what was it based on our, um, you know, the experience and, and the tools that we had? 
but having that rate stair step down from VFR down to 30 for you know five, six hours, that creates a lot of impact. And that that may have been the absolute right, you know, um, throughput to define. But we just want to ensure as we go into the spring summer and for the future of the NAS, that as the future is more about adaptive AFPs and FCAs and targeting the constraints in a more granular, you know, nature. We also bring the technology to define the appropriate capacity and rates for those because, you know, we even had um, some challenges with our dispatchers on the 24th saying, hey, you know, we want you to route out of this inland AFP because the, the delays are two to three hours. And they were saying, well, you want me to take an outboard, you know, route that's going to be 45 to 60 minutes extra flying, but I'm still seeing 60 to 90 to minute delays. So is that a good trade-off or not? Um, and that's that's part of what we as airlines need to help make those trade-offs more clear, but it's all conditioned on having the right rates and the right throughput defined for those constraints so that we can respond accordingly. Uh, Bill, did you have anything you wanted to add to um, in terms of future needs? Uh, no, I think you stated it perfectly. Uh, the scientific method for determining uh, uh, capacity is is desired, and I believe that the current method is uh, taking some of these uh, uh, static AFPs. Uh, the, the three AFPs that we ran that day uh, exist and have existed for a little while, and, and we're able to uh, have some historic values across those AFPs. But as we start moving those AFPs around a little bit more dynamically and, and possibly splitting them, uh, having some sort of technology to determine uh, the, the the right rate, as you said, is is uh, supremely important. I believe that's okay. the end of our uh, presentation. I, I I think we're ready for questions or or comments. Okay. Uh, let me jump in and say, uh, really thank you guys, uh, Bill and uh, Tim. A great presentation, especially the video. You know the uh, we you know. The front frontline operators give us the appreciation of uh, the challenge of utilize the small narrow window of opportunity to improve and enhance uh, push the volume. Uh, we will reserve the time for questions uh, at the end of ne next presentation. Next we'll have uh, thank you guys. Next we'll have Ernie uh, Stellings will give us an overview of the paper he uh, coordinated uh, last year. I think they are very good and strong point made uh, in that paper. Uh, as we, we all know, it's not a precise science for to quantify the airspace capacity, but also on that hand, there seems to be great op opportunity to uh, start from to take another look at this uh, challenge uh, topic. Ernie, are you ready? I am here. Um, just I don't see the presentation up on the screen, Matt. Can you <laughs> that up real fast? Just hold on a moment. While they're working on that, I'm just going to say, um, yeah, so um, we're a little behind, so I'm going to try to catch us up. And you guys that know me know I talk very fast, so I, I think I can catch us up really quickly. But I'm not going to read every part of the, every slide that I have here because there's a lot of in information that really can't get, be covered in like five minutes. Um, but but the nutshell is this, is the flow evaluation team, back in 2010 to 13 timeframe, we were tasked uh, by the steering group to, to kind of look at uh, the state of the art in terms of capacity, what, you know, what tools were out there. Um, what were the different vendors doing? What research was being done in that area? And so we spent a couple of years doing that. Uh, we we talked to everyone out there. We created a huge document on on FCA capacity estimation. And um, I still don't see the slides. Does anyone else have it up there yet, or no? Uh, er, Ernie, um, I'm I am missing your slides. Uh oh. Okay. Um. So hold on. Let me try to. Do you want to share yourself? If you have good enough bandwidth, I'd say I'd say. I'm gonna yes. try. I'm gonna see if I can do that. Hold on. Uh, okay. Can I don't you, have the slides either, so Ernie you will be best to do it yourself. Can you see the slides now? Is it projecting? Yes. yes. No. 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 All right. Well, we're gonna just uh, we're gonna let do me this. Try on, on my end. Uh, hold on. Hold okay. On. It should be right here. Okay. Give me one moment. Ernie's presentation here. Share my screen here. And you can just punch through for me too, Lee. Um, like I said, I'm not gonna read everything. I'm not, you know, the gist is that, you know, the, the group met, uh, yeah, scroll back a little bit, go to- Can you see it? 
Okay. Yeah, I can see it now. Yep, yep, okay. that's perfect. Oh, so go to slide two real fast. That's just a real quick uh, summation of the tasking we did that I was just talking about from 2010 to 13 with them wanting us to explore, you know, what decision support tools might be out there. And, and what we found is there really weren't, <laughs> there weren't any uh, built into the traffic manager's tool set. There wasn't really any anything out there that allows for them to really be able to predict capacity effectively in the decision-making process. You can skip to the next one real fast. I know you're giving me five minutes, so I'm gonna be so quick, watch. Um, okay, so this is some of the, the problems we found with the system. And I just wanna highlight a couple because those problems, you know, here we are 11 years later are still the same problems we had then. And, and so if you look at, uh, there's really, you know, a lack of a method to determine capacity, right? Uh, and throughput through a given piece of airspace. Um, if you look at that second bullet there, the current system relies on inaccurate uh, historical tables. Now, when, when Kurt gets up later, we'll see some of the work that they've been doing at the command center on actually updating a lot of that stuff. So there has been a lot of work done in that area from, from the time that we first wrote the document. Skip forward again, real fast. So, okay, so fast forward to 2018, the, the Group came back to us again and they said, Hey, look, FET, you know, we want you guys to look at the basically they were focusing really on AFP capacity, but you know, to us it's all the same, right? I mean, it's really you're you're looking at a piece of airspace and, and how do you determine capacity for that? And so um they wanted us to really kind of look out at at the different vendors again. And so that's what is going to lead to this next session after the lunch. Um we it's the outcome of basically what that was. But the FET uh went out to each of the vendors again and we asked them to to uh, really to provide us with where they were now, you know, 10 years later, where's your research? What what are, what are the types of technology that you're using to try to define capacity and, and so forth? Um, you can skip forward real fast here. I'm catching up, this is good. Okay, I got four minutes. Um, and the, yeah, the outcome of that was a white paper that I think was distributed or at least will, will be available to anyone out there. Um, it's a document, basically like it summarizes um, what we saw in terms of some recommendations and some conclusions that we saw that were, were still exist, I mean, still needed out there. And then also a review of what the, each of the vendors here that you're gonna hear from later um, had to say about how they're addressing those issues. So you can skip forward real fast. I think you can do two real quick. This is just talking about how, you know, some of the players here that we, we're gonna see here in a few minutes. Go ahead, the next one. See, I'm so fast. Okay, so real fast, just a couple of the conclusions. Um, and, and ironically, a lot of these are very similar to what we, we said back in 2010. Um, you know, the, we still see a value of the integration of, of a some kind of, you know, capacity estimation support tool in the traffic manager's toolbox, right? That That's still not out there. And, and there is definitely a need for it. I mean, you see that, um, you know, the inability for us over the years to, to come up with dynamic AFPs on the fly is, is really challenged because we really don't have the tools to help us determine what the, what the rates really should be. And so, you know, when you look at the old static AFPs that we've had and the work that you're going to see from Kurt in terms of updating those, and, and you, you might have seen this past couple of days, like there's some Jacksonville ones that are running splits instead of the old GX7 by itself. Um, you know, what you're seeing is that they are making some efforts in terms of trying to come up with other ways of managing instead of just having one big line in the sky that just captures everything. You know, being able to split things up and make it more uh, dynamic and on the fly is, is definitely, I think, what we're trying to go with it. Number two, what do we got? Um, very similar here. It's, it, you know, this this is really talking about, uh, you know, that, that there aren't any tools that really help the traffic manager, you know, to to uh, integrate his judgment, right? So, you know, basically what we were looking at is like, okay, we, we wish there was a tool out there that would give them some some kind of a baseline. And then from there, the traffic managers, you know, knowing the airspace and the and, and the different complexities could apply their knowledge from that point on to uh, determine, what, you know, whether the rate should be lower, or higher, and that type of thing. Okay, I got two minutes, got to go fast. Next one. Um, same kind of thing here with this. Um, you know, it's basically we're just saying that, that if there's uh, you know, if there's something the algorithm doesn't consider, you know, we have to be able to let the traffic manager make the decision making on that part of it. So to come up with what the rate should be up or down. Next. Um, this is this is what I was speaking to just a minute ago about the inability to be able to create dynamic APs on the fly. You know, there there isn't a integrated interface that helps them to determine those type of things and so that's definitely something that's lacking that we we feel needs to be addressed you know to make it easier for them next um again this just basically saying that um you know it would be good to look at the state of the art as it is now versus 10 years ago and that's what the outcome was of this is to have each of these uh, the vendors that are out there and they're going to talk to you guys after the lunch here on uh basically like their approach and things like that fast forward i think we're almost done 
Yeah, that's the last slide. Okay. Perfect. Look at that. And with one minute to spare. <laughs> okay, great. Um, uh, yeah, no, I mean, in a, in a nutshell, you know, I think the concerns of the FET are the same as they were before, which is that um, is that the traffic managers don't really have the the ability to really to, to really help themselves. There's nothing really to help them. And, and that's, I think, what we're trying to show visibility to so that, you know, the industry can can really, you know, try to come up with something to help these guys out. That's all I got. OK, great. Thank you, Ernie. Uh, I think we're, we're precisely on time. So uh, let me remind, we're going to have uh, about 15 minutes uh, panel discussion in the Q&A. And uh, we're going to stop uh, at about 12.10, uh, then take about 20 minutes break for lunch. Uh, the afternoon session will start at 12.30. So with, with that, uh, right now it's open to questions, you know, to all the panelists, of course. Uh, so, so Lee, we do have Bob Abgen, my uh, my uh, uh, MITRE colleague, monitoring the chat room, and there are questions there. Are mm -hmm. you guys okay if Bob kind of manages this discussion going forward? Uh, let me go to the chat room and see if I can see the questions here. Yeah, I've got them all. Well, just in terms of I've been making notes, uh, Lee, uh -huh. just our folks, so we don't forget anybody. But uh, you you're welcome to just kind of walk through each each person's questions, uh, and, and I'll just. I'll just back you up in case you. Uh, in fact, can you start with the first one? I'm I'm not quite familiar sure. with uh, using chat room. Okay. The first one I saw was uh, from Matthias Steiner, and he's asking, um, you know, this is for the for the first talk, right? Matthias, this was uh, from an AOC and ATC perspective. To what extent was the weather forecast for the April 11th event perceived as accurate? And and Matthias. Jump in any any time. It's for anybody. Uh, if I read through a question, you want to amplify something on there? Um, feel free. So I'll, I'll I'll just jump in from Americans' perspective. You know we do you know consume the Purdy and and participate on that. And on the 11th in particular, um, the Purdy did have the information, um, but unfortunately, it didn't have any. Um, there was no high risk or red flags that kind of jumped out at us. There was nothing that screamed and got our attention because there was talk about, you know, possible ground stops, you know, throughout the Florida region. Um, but again, the, the information was in there, but unfortunately there wasn't anything that really, you know, got our attention and gave us an indication that it could be as significant as it turned out to be from an impact perspective. And that is that is a combination of some internal processes that we need to uh, review as well. And Tim, this is Matt. Uh, you you uh, your comment was 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 in the context of Purdy, which is the day before. What about the day of? Was the TCF, uh, you know, did it hit the mark? Did you consider it to be a good forecast? You know, it did. I mean, it, again, it gave us the information, but um, there were certain things that we didn't connect the dots, you know, um, because with some of that and with some of the other risk factors that I mentioned and and trying to anticipate the added volume and the lack of, you know, availability of some of these traditionally alternate airports um, it, and combined with no hotels just really created a, a lot of separate aspects that we didn't do as good a job about connecting to to elevate the nature of the impact or the potential impact for that day. But the weather, I mean, the signals were there, at least in the morning of. Yeah, and I think if you look at the uh, the opening slide that Bill had on the presentation, you see the TCF and, it, and it's depicted there as, as how widespread uh, covering basically all of Miami Center's airspace. Um, so I think the information was was accurate. I think one of the other things we, we have a challenge with is this was early in the season. Uh, there's a bit of, uh, you know, getting everybody up to speed on uh, reacting to these events. Um, you know, it, it was the type of uh, convective activity that we haven't seen develop that way this time of year in Florida. Uh, and so even though we saw the forecast and and, and all indications are the information was accurate. How we reacted to it, I think, was a little bit slow. Uh, and one other thing I wanted, wanted to mention uh, was we were talking about capabilities. Uh, in this particular case, we ground stopped Miami Center. Uh, well, we don't have a tool that does that. 
that allows us to actually manage that. Uh, ground stops are intended for airports. Uh, and so if we went through and you know tried to capture all the airports of all the places the aircraft would actually try to transition to uh, through that airspace, uh, we don't have that tool that lets us do that. But one of the lessons learned after this event and working with industry and getting their feedback as well is, okay, we don't have that capability, so what else can we do? Uh, if we do a zero rate AFP, does that give us more control or, or things along those lines? And so um, th those are all, you know, looking at the lessons learned, really tearing this event down with all aspects, getting the feedback from industry and seeing with our current capabilities, what could we have done differently to get a different outcome? Okay. And if, and if I may, if, if you look at the, uh, the legend, uh, that's it's a medium coverage box right across the state, right? So what permeability is that? It varies across the country, I would think. I, I think maybe there was an expectation that there were more holes in it than there actually were, or the, the root structure was just so impacted that, that it couldn't be dynamic enough to adjust to, to hitting those holes. So um, that's just another thing that I would throw in there, uh, looking at the TCF. Um, I was going to uh, maybe in the hopes of uh, being efficient, I want to try to combine a couple of questions here, if I may, uh, from Rob and and Mark uh, Kloppenstein. Mark's raised a, a you know a, a problem that you know as we've discussed, you know, yet without any strong solution. But Rob asked, um, you know, do we think the convective forecasts are at an accurate enough point for more granularity in the programs? And he's suggesting uh, use of probabilistic forecasting to give the uncertainty information needed for the granularity needed. And to go along with that, I wanted to kind of lump Mark's comment in here about the accuracy of the forecast and them, that their uh, lack of stability, uh, given the forecast keep changing significantly from hour to hour, makes a challenging kind of plan, you know, and not kind of fall back to that, you know, well, let's see what happens mode. So maybe in the context of, of both of those uh, gentlemen's questions, um, if the responders, if the presenters could uh, respond. And guys, please, Mark, Rob, jump in here if you want to amplify anything that I've uh, said in your comment. And and I, I will say that that uh, Rob's question was put in there as Tim was talking about being more surgical, and I, I think there's a there's a place for you to hear Tim to maybe weigh in and say, yay, yes, I think they're good enough to to support that kind of a surgical look, or maybe we need something better. Yeah, I think they're still. I don't think they're ever going to be good enough, <laughs> but I think they're getting better. Um, but I do think being more targeted um, because some of the traditional FCAs are just way too big and you're over constraining certain areas where you don't need to be. Um, and so, and, and that being more fine tuned or more surgical can also apply to altitude. It doesn't have to just necessarily apply to lat, you know, lateral um, definitions. Um, but I do like the, I, the concept of moving more towards a probabilistic, you know, uh, forecasting perspective. And that's, that's something that internally we're trying to get our heads wrapped around um, because we realize that there is uncertainty, but translating that uncertainty into actual risk or contingency plans is a challenge. Um, but, you know, let's say we did have a, a true probabilistic uh, forecast for this, then we would expect to see that there is a scenario for which all the routes may be cut off where there is zero permeability. And that may be a 20% or whatever, but at least knowing that that exists can allow us to create a contingency or risk plan for that. And so we, we operationally are moving more towards an operational risk kind of planning mindset where a probabilistic forecast would really make sense because what we would like to do is to distill that probabilistic distribution down into some discrete scenarios, each of which which may have a likelihood of occurring. And then we can plan for those different scenarios. And then as the re, as the forecast continue to evolve, hopefully one of those scenarios will start to come more into picture or focus than the other ones. But at least we've captured the full range of possible scenarios 
so that we're not, you know, we're not chasing ourselves, which is what happened for us on the 11th. Okay, great. Uh, this is Lee again. I do see a lot of questions and comments uh, given the uh, time and stuff. The, uh, there are, of course, uh, suggestions for full-on discussion. That, that's really good. In the afternoon, we'll have some of those. And uh, right now, I do see one question from David Bidger from uh, FA Command Center, an uh, an NWS uh, a meteorologist. And also, he has also a comment. I would uh, like to ask David uh, uh, to to speak for himself. What 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 is your question or suggestion to the to this uh, to the panel? Sure. Thanks, Lee. No, mm -hmm. really, just kind of looking at what folks are saying, trying to kind of just share some information. Um, for them, um, you know, so what, what got my attention is, is that, um, you know, at the command center, uh, the team here was really heavily messaging this, um, you know, four days out, we were kind of leaning in on this and then pretty the day prior, really kind of hitting this uh, heavily. So, you know, if, if there was the perception that there wasn't a lot of emphasis in, in the party discussions the day prior on this, then it potentially speaks to the way that maybe that was getting communicated or messaged. If the forecast was good, but the message wasn't resonating with our partners um, to, to key them in on decisions that they would need to take, then just looking for feedback from the group on how better we could message that, at least on the, the side of the meteorologist to really kind of draw in the attention there. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, kind of looking, doing a, a deep dive and a rundown of the event, you know, we, we did see a few things. There were some TCF timing and position errors. Um, but, uh, you know, in the 15 to 23 Z valid times, there was a lot of skill and accuracy in the forecast. We really saw that the HER itself um, really kind of started out the day uh, bad. It was several hours too slow. So we know that that, if you're just looking at that particular model, gave the appearance that, that this event um, was moving much faster. Um, you know, the squall line, you know, definitely its outflow aided the accelerated uh, southward push. Um, the herd caught up, but, you know, certainly if you were looking at that one piece of, of guidance. So, you know, just, you know, from our perspective, I think, how can we get our messaging better to a decision maker so that you have what you need and, and you're really alerted um, to it? And then the other comment was just kind of reference um, medium areas, you know, from a TCF collaborator perspective, um, and the way that we kind of train sparse and medium here at the command center to the decision makers here, um, there's a general lack of permeability implied in the medium, regardless of the geographic area that we're in there. So, you know, we're kind of hoping that when, when the medium is up there, you're thinking broken line or, or very uh, dense area where there just aren't going to be a lot of gaps. So it was just kind of responding to that. Um, no real questions on my end other than how we can get better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, I, I like to follow up. Uh, I remember and want to uh, reinforce the point that uh, NOAA and also the development community can make changes. Uh, remember the days we, st we, we have for a number of years CCFP product. Now at some point we switch to TCF, which have much narrower uh, focus, you know, more pinpoint type. Of course, it's not enough, you know, given our days. Okay. But uh, uh, but the point is that as long as the direction is clear, uh, I, I really strongly believe the research and the community can come up with uh, refined uh, uh, improvement uh, solutions to support the uh, front lines. Okay, we have one minute left for additional questions or comments. Let me see uh, who else here. I do see a few comments. I, I guess everybody else can see it uh, from Jason Baker, from Michael uh, Split. Uh, anyone else have uh, any additional questions at this point? So mine isn't so much a question. This is a Jason Baker. I, I just I sent in a, a quick email during the discussion to Matt Franzek. You know, there was some some discussion on permeability, you know, and kind of what that means. And I was just kind of curious if, you know, if, if any of the folks on the phone, the operators who who were involved with that event, you know, can kind of speak to, you know, what tools you guys used that day. I mean, I, I agree with you, but Kevin Johnson's comment that we got to make the connection to the terminology. But, you know, there's but there's also some tools out there 
Um, one's called the Traffic Flow Impact, the TFI, and it it does just that. It it converts portions of airspace and overlays the weather and determines the permeability uh, or gives a like a guess of permeability. Um, it's not throughout the whole country. We don't have it, I don't believe, for Miami Center, but it is for Jacksonville Center. And uh, I see Matt's pulling up the graphic I, I sent him now. So this was uh, the morning of the 11th. Um, I went back and grabbed it at so 14Z. Um, I can go back and get like a different time if so folks are interested. But this is a Jacksonville uh, airspace, so, so 001, kind of the central part there of the state. And you can kind of see, you know, it, it, it certainly kind of indicates it's in the crapper, you know, if you will, from uh, down in the, the deep red there, only, you know, 10 to 20 percent to permeability. And then it's, uh, you know, going to start to improve as time goes on. I, I, I would suspect if I went back and grabbed an earlier time, um, you would probably see it kind of to nosedive, you know, from uh, the greens and yellows to down in the reds. But that that saline in the center is supposed to give you um, the best guess, if you will. And then those um, that bluish region is uh, kind of putting some bounds onto it. You know, what's the best case and the worst case, or the best case and worst case type scenario. So I, okay. I don't know if anyone should use that product before or have any of you have comments about it. Okay. Uh... Thank you so much for providing uh, the uh, more insightful information. I think I really uh, think this is exactly the kind of dialogue we need as a community. Uh, for the sake of time, we're just one minute over. Matt and uh, Matthias, are we good to take a break now for 20 minutes and come back 12.30? Absolutely, Lee. Okay. Good okay. Lee. okay, great. <laughs> thank you so much. Th thank all the uh, presenters this morning and uh, really great uh, dialogue uh, you, you guys uh, started. Thank you very much. Okay. Talk to you later. Okay. All right. Uh, I have 1230 and since timeliness is next to godliness, we should get going again here. What do you think, Ernie? Let's do it. Let's go. All right. Well, Matthias uh, has uh, stepped out for a second uh, to run an errand and my, my MITRE co-conspirator Bob Abgen monitoring the chat has also perhaps stepped out for a few minutes and, and we'll be back shortly, but it may just be you and me or any running this thing. So we'll, we'll see That's if we fine. can make this happen. We'll, we'll make it happen. All right. So if you want to go ahead and introduce your session and I'll get the slides. Right. Yeah, perfect. Hey, welcome back everybody from your short uh, lunch break. Uh, again, Ernie Stellings with the MBAA. Um, Thanks for uh, all you guys for uh, for putting up with us this afternoon <laughs> and, and hearing from us uh, and, and some of the research we've uh, been looking at in, in terms of, uh, you know, really being able to look at the different types of capacity uh, researches out there. And so we've got four presentations coming up here and I'll let each of the guys just take a second to introduce themselves. Uh, and we'll just do it in order of, of the way it's set up in the agenda. So, so Chris, you can go first. Um, okay. Uh, I'll just I'll just run with it then. Thanks, Ernie. Uh, thanks, Matt. And Matt, why don't you just keep on with the slides so that we can uh, just get right into it. Um, I'm Chris Britton from Mosaic ATM. This is work that we <clears throat> did along with uh, AVMET uh, under NASA funding to look at uh, capacity estimation. Uh, you can go ahead and go to that next slide. That's fine. Um, I think this will fit very well with the discussions that we've had so far, particularly the discussion about uh, the uh, TFI tool that was uh, just referred to and also uh, what, what Tim was referring to in regard to the future needs looking for dynamic AFPs, uh, FCAs, and being able specifically to determine the capacity uh, that would be appropriate or the, I'll, I'll refer to it as the program rate. Um, because one of the first things I want to do is differentiate between the capacity of the FCA, which I think doesn't really matter, or it matters, but it's not really the most important thing. I, I will wa want to encourage you to think of the FCA as a control mechanism to manage the airspace demand, but that the actual constraint may not be and is likely not at the FCA itself, especially if we're using a line-based FCA, but the constraint is the, the sector capacity, the sector controller's workloads, maybe your root capacity, but the FCA is just a, a way that we use to establish a, a program rate 
to be able to control the flow through that FCA so that the uh, demand is managed um, in that area, but also potentially other areas. Now, um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, so what I'm arguing is that what we really need to do then is to try to determine how to set the program rate to manage to the sector capacities or whatever the true constraints are. Again, recognizing that the FCA and the AFP itself is, is just really a control mechanism to that. Uh, we have to include consideration of sectors that may receive uh, offload traffic uh, and how we're doing that because as we see that there's a limited uh, capacity uh, in some sectors that traffic may be offloaded to other areas and so we have to also consider what that's going to mean for those those adjacent areas. So basically what, what our approach does is we use a probabilistic model to develop an estimate of the, the permeability and the weather adjusted sector capacity to be able to determine for all of the sectors that might be impacted what the uh, impact of the weather is going to be in regard to that that sector's capacity and then we use the fca to figure out how to control that and i should say that the other way around what we really do is we look at what needs to change in the airspace to be able to meet capacities and then we figure out what fca and what program rates uh, are best to be able to to do that to meet the actual constraints so if you would flip to the next slide um, our overall approach then kind of has a number of different steps. The first step that I referred to there is first of all being able to have a sector congestion, a sector permeability prediction. And it sounds like that's very similar to this, this TFI tool. Um, you know, I'm not as familiar with the TFI tool, but in our work, uh, AVMET developed that sector permeability prediction model. And then we combine that with a demand prediction to figure out how much there is a, uh, a likelihood of congestion. Again, all of this is done probabilistically. You can kind of see the, you know, indication in the middle there, the convolution of the different uh, uncertainty distributions. There you go, exactly, uh, for the predicted load and the predicted capacity to come up with a congestion metric. From that, then, we're, we're coming up with the design of the FCA. Again, a dynamic FCA that's specifically tuned uh, to the needs of the particular weather situation. And then we can finally select a set of program rates to be able to use uh, in, an, in an AFP. So if you would flip, flip forward to the, the next slide, uh, this is just a quick slide to show the uh, scan line permeability uh, approach that AVMET developed as our partner on this, uh, on this project. Uh, this comes up with a a probabilistic prediction of what the permeability and, and as a result, the remaining capacity will be of each of the sectors on a sector by sector basis. And uh, as an aside, I'll just mention that it's also done in an altitude perspective also. So, uh, you know, a super high may have a different level of permeability and capacity than a uh, directly underlying high sector. Uh, so uh, Abbott did a great job in, in, in putting that together. Um, next slide shows our approach then to use this. This is a ton of detail here, but basically what we're doing is we're doing a probabilistic model of uh, trajectory option set reroutes to figure out how the traffic could be spread, again, from a, from a probabilistic perspective, which means that this output of this particular model right here is not implementable because we can't take one flight and split it into, you know, one tenth of a flight going on this route and uh, two tenths of a flight going on this route and, you know, the remainder going on another route. But that's exactly what we're doing in our model. Uh, and that's basically what this, this diagram says is that we're iterating over a probabilistic spreading of the traffic such that each time we go through this iteration, we are resolving the capacity uh, constraint, the congestion exceeding the capacity uh, in one sector, but then that may spread uh, the congestion to a different sector. This is graphically depicted on the next slide. If you jump to the next one, this might be a little bit more clear. <clears throat> so this is just a single route for a single flight uh, that's going through a sector that we've identified that has a capacity constraint or has congestion in it. And the 
particular case here was that the capacity was three in this sector, the demand was 20. And so from a probabilistic perspective, we want to reduce the likelihood that a particular flight is going to go through that to be only 15% of its full <clears throat> of its full likelihood. 85% likely it's got to go around. Now, again, there are probably three flights that are really going to be selected to go through this, but we don't know which ones. So that's why we're doing this probabilistically. Now, hopefully all that detail, go on to the next slide, will become a little bit more clear when you see what the result is. So this is a pretty busy picture here, but once you understand how to interpret it, it's pretty interesting. The map there is showing how much the traffic needs to be reduced in the blue colors, the blue cells, and how much it can be increased in other cells. But the super important thing to recognize here is that across all of this, the weather adjusted sector capacity is not exceeded. So in other words, this shows you what needs to happen in terms of moving traffic away from congested areas, and it's all done probabilistically to be able to resolve the capacity constraint. The question now from this is, okay, well, if we're gonna do an AFP with an FCA, what do we actually do? And, and basically you see that kind of we have a blue line going in the middle. That's where the capacity, that's where the demand needs to be reduced. We have green lines kind of above to the north and to the south. That's where the traffic can be offloaded to, but we've modeled out through these iterations to the extent that we only have to go that far. We don't have to go farther, but we will not exceed the capacity in those offload sectors by doing this. And so if you go to the next slide, you can see how this looks in a uh, depiction on a sector by sector basis. And then one more time, uh, go to the next slide again. All right, and so now this, if you click on the uh, animation, is gonna show you where you could draw an FCA. So you see that what we're doing is we're drawing an FCA that covers the blue area because that's where we need to reduce the demand, but we don't have to go into the green areas because it's okay for the traffic to increase there. And we've done the computations to see that probabilistically that will not exceed the capacity of those sectors. If we thought there was a high probability that it would exceed the capacity of those sectors, then the FCA would be drawn further. The program rate then can be calculated from that probabilistic model. And then that program rate on the next slide can be put directly into FSM to run an AFP. Um, that was a lot, that's my last slide, but my point is that uh, you know, this is how we can identify the real constraints in the airspace and identify both a dynamic FCA as well as a program rate to be able to control to the real constraints. And I'll definitely say that you know, our expectation is that the program rate would be a, a recommendation to the, the traffic management specialist, uh, could be used collaboratively, but provides a, a scientific basis upon which to try to make these decisions. Um, and that's it. Uh, 10 minutes. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much there. We're going to go now. We're going to do questions at the end. Uh, there's a, some time set aside to do questions. So we'll go to uh, Kurt now to, to talk about the uh, command center's approach at, at rate setting for some of the AFPs. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and good morning to those out in the Midwest and on the West Coast. Um, is somebody going to run the slides for me? Or, or do you want me to pull it up? Hey Matt, you there? Yeah, I'm. I'm there. I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm old, but I'm slow. Hang on, I'm, I'm almost with you. <laughs> well, and Kurt, that's up to you. If you want Matt to switch him, he can do it, or you know, yeah. however you want to do it. Yeah, go ahead if you don't mind, Matt. I appreciate okay. that. So okay. uh, while he's setting it up, uh, you know, again, Kurt Rademacher, manager of NAS efficiency here at the command center. Uh, today, I'm, uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about the work that we did last year to improve FCA throughputs. And also talk a little bit about AFP rates and how we come up with those. Maybe a little bit of a review of what Greg already uh, covered. So um, you can go to the next slide there. Yeah, there you go. First slide there. So, you know, first, before I start, um, just a little bit of a, a review or some background. 
Um, last year in 2020, uh, the ATO and industry came together uh, to establish uh, five efficiency areas to concentrate on uh, in 2020. And uh, um, these were called the VP uh, efficiency initiatives, and uh, they're now being dubbed the Focus Five. Uh, one of those initiatives was to reevaluate FCA throughput so that we have good or have a good starting point uh, for those day of operation uh, conversations for rate reductions in AFPs. Um, we specifically targeted the Northeast AFPs and FCAs. Uh, and the reason uh, we did that uh, was because some of those throughput rates haven't been uh, reevaluated in 10 to 15 years. Um, so just kicking it off into this first slide here, you know, the first step in managing any in route uh, airspace constraint is known what normal capacity is through a specified area under unconstrained conditions, right? This gives us a, a good accurate starting point to have those AFP rate uh, reduction conversations uh, based on current and uh, forecasted constraints. Um, so what you see up there, the pictures, uh, those are the two basic uh, AFP strategies that we use up in the Northeast. Uh, the one on the right is uh, the traditional uh, older uh, strategy, the OB1 uh, A08. Um, I think that those were invented um, somewhere around 2006, 2008 timeframe. Uh, the picture on the left is a more recent um, kind of inception on how we use AFPs up in the Northeast. Um, I think those were developed somewhere around 2016. And uh, they're, they're, they're basically designed around airspace uh, design sector, uh, airspace, uh, facility airspace, uh, center boundaries, and also known and established traffic flows. Uh, the reason why we kind of like to use kind of static uh, FCAs or AFPs is, uh, you know, it establishes a common ground of understanding for all the facilities and NAS users to, to know what, um, you know, throughputs are, normal AFP rates are, where the lines are, how to file in and out of uh, those particular uh, lines, um, and it reduces coordination time. If we were going to build a dynamic uh, FCA, um, you know, you're, you're going to do a lot of time coordinating with the facilities, explaining it, uh, trying to determine what throughput is, uh, where these, we basically already have uh, the science behind it. You can go to the next slide. So these are the uh, the old FCA throughput numbers. Uh, these, like I said, because of the age of these FCAs, they haven't been uh, looked at, reevaluated, um, readjusted in many, many years. The OB1 and A08, uh, I think uh, those are 12 to 15 years old. So um, you can go to the next slide. So we basically had two actions uh, to, to look at, you know, we wanted to use more relevant data to measure FCA throughput. And then we also wanted to determine what normal throughput was or unconstrained FCA throughput, UFT is what we like to call it. Um, so how did we, um, how and what did we use to, to measure FCA throughput? We used PDARS data of actual traffic worked. And we went as far back as about 2016, but we have solid data for 2017, 2018, and 2019. Um, and we basically defined an hourly throughput for each day. And then we used that data to determine what normal was. And how we did that was we took the three busiest hours of any day, we averaged it, and that's what we called the daily uh, throughput. Um, we used hourly values and not like 15 minute values just because hourly values kind of show sustainability where 15 minute peak uh, values might be a little bit, um, you know, too, uh, too much on the high side where, uh, you know, the controllers can gut out a 15 minute period with a, a tracker or a D side or, or, or whatnot, but sustainability, maybe not so much. So we want to use uh, hours. And then we took the 14 busiest days out of a uh, out of the year and averaged those, and that's what we came up uh, with as our um, our uh, UFT. So, and you can go to the next slide. And these are the new numbers that we came up with. This is what we uh, kind of determined uh, was what a controller or controllers in those uh, areas through those lines should be able to work on a unconstrained day. And for comparison, you can go to the next slide. 
there is the uh, old FCA throughput numbers in green uh, versus the new. So as you can see, we were working a lot more traffic uh, through those areas than what we thought we were uh, using our uh, old system of measuring throughput. Um, and we're hoping that by, by having this new starting point, when we start to talk about permeability and uh, rate reductions, you know, in a in a, a percentage form, uh, we're actually going to have a much higher AFP rate uh, than we did before because we're starting at a much higher uh, number or throughput. Uh, you can go to the next slide. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, AFP rates and how we determine those. And again, some of this will be a review from what uh, Greg already said. But uh, before you know, uh, I go into that, um, this is kind of our little disclaimer. And I know that uh, Greg even mentioned it, but you know, determining the correct capacity and throughput of an AFP is not an exact science. It requires intuitive knowledge of the airspace and the flows of traffic in and out of the area. Uh, and it's also based on a forecast that's several hours in the future. Um, I, I'm not going to talk too much about timing. Uh, I know Greg talked about it, but uh, you know, to, in order to capture the West Coast uh, demand that departs, normally you need to issue an AFP strategy uh, five to six hours in advance uh, so that you can capture those aircraft on the ground. Otherwise, you run the risk of uh, penalizing the closer in uh, airports, uh, basically from the Midwest uh, to the uh, constrained area. Uh, so we try to do it uh, as early as possible, and so now you're looking at uh, potentially a six-hour uh, TCF uh, to try to make that determination. Um, and you can go to the next slide. So these are some of the factors uh, that we use to determine AFP uh, rates, um, and I've kind of broken them down into two different categories. You have the, the weather considerations, and then you also have the, uh, the system considerations. Um, so again, the weather uh, considerations I think are are, are pretty um, straightforward. You know, what's the the forecasted permeability of the thunderstorms, the location, the type and speed of the thunderstorm activity? Is it an air mass? Is it a line? Is it a cluster? You know, what are the other weather impacts in the region? Is there turbulence that's forcing aircraft down uh, lower, or keeping aircraft up higher to fly over it and then diving down into uh, into the uh, the airports. Uh, what are the airport impacts? Are we running you know other GDPs? Um, are there uh, thunderstorms uh, impacting high density airways, or is it kind of sitting out there in a good place right now? So all of that is uh, those are those weather considerations. Some of the system considerations that you know our our NOMs and our NTMOs need to uh, consider is you know the airspace usage. You know, are we managing flights that are primarily in route, or are we managing the arrivals versus departures? Um, you know, favoring uh, favoring the arrivals or the departures is an important point because if we want to uh, favor the departures out of New York, uh, we're probably going to ratchet down that arrival AFP rate a little bit so that we can ensure that we uh, are improving our departure throughput. Um, you know, is the primary FCA managing the weather impact or the secondary F FCA managing uh, the volume due to the offloads? So. Uh, and then the other TMIs used in conjunction. Um, you know, do we have Canadian airspace available to us to to run uh, can routes? Are we going to do capping and tunneling? Is a Zuzu available? Um, are we going to run route structure into the area, or, or is it, um, you know, that uh, that uh, those cluster thunderstorms where root structure probably won't work. So those are all things that are kind of running through, uh, you know, the specialist minds and the NTMO and the NOMS minds when we're determining uh, those those rate reductions. And you can go back or go to the next slide. Yeah, thank you. So we do um, have what we, as a guideline, uh, our low, medium, and high impact AFP rate ranges. So again, uh, there on the on the left are our, our new FCA throughput numbers, and then uh, we kind of broke down uh, based on percentage of impact. Uh, so basically, zero to twenty percent impact would be a low uh, system impact. Twenty to forty percent would be a medium system impact, and then greater than forty percent uh, will be our our high system impact. So, and again, uh, you know, based on what the strategy of the day is. You might have a low uh, weather impact day where you know you're looking at 20% permeability, but since you want to favor the departures out of the region, you might actually use a medium uh, impact rate range. So, so you know this these are all just kind of guidelines just to kind of get you you know get the the specialist thinking about kind of where we want to be. 
Next slide. OK, and um, so I just threw this slide in here this morning. Um, this kind of shows you, and this goes back to uh, July 7th of 2019. Um, this is the day that we, we had an AFP strategy in place. Um, on the left is a, a time, it's 13Z, and it's looking at the six-hour TCF. So you can kind of see what the, the weather forecast was. And I know that we, we look at other uh, forecast models and such, but, uh, you know, the, the TCF is one of the primary ones. So uh, we decided to put in uh, AFPs on this day. As you can see on the right side at 19Z uh, with the same TCF overlay, is uh, where the weather actually developed. So you can kind of see that it's developing in areas that weren't quite forecasted uh, and to an intensity a little bit more than what was forecasted, uh, especially out there in the Cleveland, New York boundary. Um, so you can uh, also see down there um, to the southwest of uh, Wash Center, some additional thunderstorms developing that uh, wasn't forecasted. So. Those are all the, the variables that, that we have to deal with when we're, we're starting to talk about uh, rate reductions is, you know, the confidence in the forecast as well. Are we sure this is where the, the weather is going to line up or is there a potential to have it in other locations? And we have to always kind of keep into consideration, you know, that keeping these sectors safe. And, and if you've ever been in a, any one of these en route uh, facilities or looked at a map, actually I tried to find a map this morning to put on here of all the different sectors um, in that region. And it was, it was just a spaghetti bowl of lines. It wouldn't have made any sense to any of you. So I didn't put it on here, but very, very, very complex airspace. And, um, you know, when aircraft start to deviate uh, off the routes into other airspace, it gets it gets very complex. So we have to take that all that into consideration as well. It's not just the the weather forecast, but also trying to keep that safe and manageable in and out of that region. Uh, next slide. Okay, and that is all I have. Uh, I guess we'll save questions for the end. You are correct, Greg. So I'm getting a weird aircraft. Okay, uh, next up we have uh, Ken and Lee. I think I'm not sure how you guys want to handle this, but uh, you can do the next session. Just a so, brief question of yourselves. So, so Ernie, I, I need you to be like um, congenial TV host and chat with Ken and Lee for just a minute while I get set up. Hi, guys. How's your day? <laughs> <I'm just> <laughs> <laughs> so, so good. <laughs> hey, that's all right, Ernie. I can just get started while Matt's pulling that up. So, okay. Hey. Hey, I'm Ken Fenton, and I work with the Forecast Impact and Quality Assessment Services Branch uh, with NOAA's Global Systems Laboratory. And our primary focus is on doing verification and typically for aviation hazards um, for the FAA. And so a lot of what you're going to see today is kind of comes from a verification focus, but can also be applied in the forecast direction as well. So thanks for putting the slides up, Matt. Next slide, please. And so in order to um, evaluate the amount of constraint in the airspace, we've come up with something called the flow constraint index. And I give you a graphical depiction here on the slide. And so in a corridor of airspace, which is represented by those two blue bars, uh, we're looking at a flight going through that corridor from left to right. And within that corridor, there's a hazard. It could be a thunderstorm. It could be any other type of weather hazard as well. But what we're trying to do is calculate the amount of airspace that is actually constrained by that hazard. And so we use this formula in the lower left where we look at the amount of airspace that is still permeable through that corridor. Next slide, please. And so this approach is applied onto a group of hexagons that are overlaid across the entire NAS uh, to give us the constraint in certain areas. And we use a certain size of hexagon in order to approximate the width of jet routes. And the hexagon shape is nice because it fits together into a contiguous grid as well. It also does a good job of capturing the orientation of the hazards. Next slide, please. And so even when the hazard um, is oriented north-south or east-west, by taking these three different slices through the hexagon uh, as represented by airflow corridors, we can measure that constraint in these different directions, come up with different values, and come up with an average for what that cell actually has as its constraint. Next slide, please. And so we take this approach of those overlaid hexagons, 
and uh, put it over the convection forecast or the observations, and then combine it with the traffic forecast to come up with this airflow constrained by weather. And on the next slide, you'll see a web tool that we've put together called Insight, um, which shows a graphical depiction of the constraint both in the map on the right, as well as the grid cells on the middle of your graphic that show an hour by hour depiction of the weather constraint color coded by that legend in the bottom middle of the graph. So here you see the constraint over two artsies uh, for Chicago and Fort Worth. If you go to the next slide, uh, the user also has the ability to draw their own polygon and constraint is calculated over that user supplied set of coordinates. Uh, next, you can also um, apply this constraint for a host of different forecast and observation products. For observations, you can apply it to CWIS, uh, radar observations for forecasts, we look at high resolution deterministic like the HER, probabilistic forecasts like the Schreff and LAMP, as well as a synthesis product, which is essentially an ensemble of high resolution model output together. Next. In addition to this, uh, we also integrate historic and current traffic together to show you where the constraint's gonna be depending upon those two things. And so in this little case study example, we have a derecho squall line of thunderstorms that's about to move through Chicago, obviously going to cause a lot of constraint there, but also a secondary line of thunderstorms up in Minnesota by uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul. And so if you go to the next slide, um, you, on the left, you'll see the constraint under the historic traffic. So think this is the amount of traffic that would typically be going through the area on Thursday at 2 p.m. And under that scenario, a lot of constraint, as you would expect, is generated in that derecho area with a squall line moving towards Chicago. But when we look at the current amount of traffic on the right, these are the plans that have actually been filed for all of the flights. We see that they've already taken into account the forecast of this line of thunderstorms moving through Illinois, have moved the traffic up to the north. And what this does is actually increases the constraint near Minneapolis, St. Paul which is important for controllers to know that as they move this constraint around the NAS, they might be um, generating additional constraint in areas that they didn't expect because of weather in those other locations. Next, please. And so that's kind of currently where we're at. I just wanted to throw out a few ideas as well for uh, areas of future investigation. One could possibly be looking at playbook recommendation, a second one could be looking at free flight rather than looking at these specific air corridors. And lastly, we could also look at calculating the constraint in the terminal area versus the on-route approaches that you've previously seen. So on the next slide, we'll first look at this playbook recommendation, where in this scenario, we have a group of thunderstorms in Virginia and North Carolina that's blocking that main north-south passage from the northeast down to Florida. And on the next slide, um, you'll see a group of three different playbooks that the FAA has to kind of mitigate some of these scenarios. And so the first one kind of just goes north-south along the eastern seaboard. In the upper right, we have the second one that goes through Atlanta, then through West Virginia to, to bow around some convection. Or the third one on the bottom that goes further out to the west through Indianapolis Center and takes a approach from the west into the New York area to try to avoid convection. So on the next slide, you could envision a scenario where we actually rank order these playbooks to provide a recommendation to operators on which one's gonna be most effective based off of that calculated constraint that you see on the right there. On the next slide, I'll just briefly talk about the modeling optimal free flight. And so on the graphic on the right, you see a set of three just randomly drawn polygons and the idea here is that you have these different lines that are being calculated going through those polygons to try to find the best route around that minimizes the distance. And so we use this graph theory in order to calculate the optimal path through these hazards. And on the next slide, you'll see an example of this um, that happens as the weather is actually evolving. So you see the little black dot there moving from DC towards Chicago and that is representative of flight, and the constraint is modeled from a forecast of the HER with the convection actually evolving through time. And you'll see that that aircraft actually is advised to kind of reroute around the convection as that forecast evolves through time. On the next slide, lastly, I'll just quickly touch on the fact that 
everything previously discussed has been in route impacts and there's also the terminal area that needs to be considered and so um, we we look at the stars and SIDS because these are points that you kind of have to hit as you're going in and out of the uh, airspace around an airport and so on the next slide um, we've been kind of looking at this in a verification standpoint where we're trying to say does this forecast give you good information um, about the near terminal operations because those corridors become much smaller as you move towards the airport than what you have in your in route airspace. And so those are just some ideas for future work. And I'll turn it over to Lee now to discuss a practical example of how we've applied this work together with IMSG. Okay, uh, thank you, Ken. Uh, uh, let's go to the next, please. Okay. So basically, right now we are, uh, the reason I call it the alternative approach because we uh, work with uh, GSD. Uh, focusing on the, uh, you know, especially for us as a company, we'll fo focus on the uh, methodology fundamentals. The fundamentals is one of the graphic you see in Ken's slides, the uh, corridor uh, constraint calculation. Uh, if that's, if that index, FCI is so, so important and uh, also can give a lot of examples showing the uh, FCI based uh, constraint uh, uh, pictures, uh, but uh, ultimately, what we we want to see whether it's impossible to you just use FCI and use something like what Kurt talked about the maximum capacity that derived uh, from historical data or from the maximum clear uh, the best clear day cases. If we have that index, the index by the way is between zero to one, we can easily scale back and see what is the weather impacted capacity available. To, to use, okay. Uh, I in in a way it's very simple, okay. And we purposely want to make it simple because you know uh, there are a lot of constraint uh, in the uh, real time operations, uh, not even consider the uh, human uh, coordination aspect. So we actually uh, simplified some of the uh, calculation and use a square box instead of hexagon box because of most of the numerical model nowadays are square box and calculate the uh, FCI directly and assuming the maximum capacity is given. So we can easily map the uh, root segment capacity and waypoint capacity and sector capacity. Okay, next please. So between 2018, uh, 2019, we were funded uh, by US Trade and Development Agency uh, to uh, to try some approach for the East China airspace. This is also working with uh, uh, GSD, uh, Ken's uh, group uh, under a crater. There are a lot of US airlines participated like uh, uh, Delta, UAAA, and uh, basically tried this approach and also the original FCI approach and do comparison studies. The end result is very similar. Uh, and uh, basically, they need the uh, capacity, available capacity in uh, root segments, waypoints, and sectors. Those can be estimated. The 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 other aspect we uh, choose to ignore to model is, of course, is the human workload side. And interesting enough, in real time operations, the operators, air traffic controllers, told us although they have a guideline, clear day. Uh, capacity for certain routes, but with doubled workforce, for instance, they can exceed that capacity uh, at 120% rate for three hours, okay? Uh, and that's exactly reflect the, comp the complexity of this uh, problem uh, or challenge to quantify airspace capacity. So I'm gonna stop here and uh, Ernie, uh, let Ernie to uh, get to the next presentation. Thank you. All right, guys. Appreciate that, Ken and, and Lee. Uh, next, we have uh, Michael with uh, from the MIT Lincoln Labs group. Hello, everyone. This is Mike Matthews from uh, MIT Lincoln Lab. Um, I think I think Matt has been doing a great job as producer of the show here with controlling the slide deck and getting them up pretty quickly. <laughs> Keep talking, Mike. Keep talking, Mike. <laughs> um, 
I can tell you, uh, we here at Lincoln have been working on this, as you'll hear from Jim Evans, for a very, whoops, hit the wrong button, just as I went to hit. Um, been for a very long time, but I'm going to talk to you about Traffic Flow Impact Tool. If you could go ahead and move to the two slides from this one, Matt. The next one's a disclaimer, but here we go. So here's the Traffic Flow Impact Tool um, and the display that is available on the COSPA system. So those of you who have access to COSPA, um, you can certainly go look at this tool. And you can actually go back and look at previous cases to get a sense of how it had done in uh, previous events. And I'd encourage you to do that for the April uh, 11th case because um, as Jason had shown earlier, it did a really good job while the event was going on, but more importantly, as the event is uh, predicted and forecasted to occur in the future, um, you can see the performance of the algorithm at that point. So, so, um, so we started working on this in 2013, and this tool was um, sort of a prototype was developed in 2015 and has been available in the command center now for a, a number of years, and it'll be there again this summer. And eventually the tool will end up um, in a slightly different form on the NWP system. Um, so really what you need to do is have Cosper and then click on the, the, the button. This is Traffic Flow Impact Tool, and that'll bring up what's on the bottom of the display there. So you can look at each artsy um, and get a sense of the impact from you know, green, yellow, red sense. And then you can look at an individual um, Traffic Flow Impact or TFI region um, and get a sense of how that forecast is predicting the impact in the in the uh, you know traffic light sense over the next several hours. So we we can call that sort of the first order of analysis of an impact on a, on the, the the system. And you can also then click on a particular region, and it'll bring up what you see here on the top right. Um, and I think uh, Jason had shown this to you earlier. I'll show you a number of more examples in a few minutes. And we can think of that as the second order of information which gives you the permeability value over time with the color coding, of course, in the background. But you can look at the median forecast for permeability um, in the solid blue line with the dot at each hour. And then the spread of what the potential permeabilities will be on the uncertainty on the forecast information that machine learning has determined for you. OK, and I know Jim Evans will talk about this a lot more later today. Um, I'm showing you here a pretty old case. That's why the spread is very large. We've done a really good job of getting that um, uncertainty bound to really reflect more reality uh, as we've gone on through the years. Um, and so, but that is second order. And really the third order is predicting flow rates, okay? And if you go to the next slide, please, Matt, um, what we've done is we've been able to correlate our permeability, permeability algorithm with flow rates over a very, very, very large case set. We have 216 days from 2011 through 2019 that have been um, evaluated um, for, for lots. I mean, we're talking hundreds of different TFI regions. I know sort of folks have been asking in the chat on COSPA right now, that's a very limited set, mostly because of that's what we were told to do. And it's a prototype. So we were really trying to get a sense of um, decision makers uh, information, what they can gather out of that. Um, but for our, our analysis here, we're looking at this ZMY and ZUB uh, transition airspace, and we're doing a box and whisker chart comparing the permeability to flow rate. Uh, permeability is binned into values of 20, but if you look on the far right, we have a value of 100. This is a no weather impact. When we're saying 100, the value is uh, indicative that there is no impact. And in, a, in our case set, we do have a few what we'll call null days. Um, and you can see here we have a good evaluation of the no weather impact day and the flow rates through that airspace in hourly increments. And then also for each of the different permeability values, you can see what a nominal median value is of the flow through that airspace, as well as a likely range of spread. Um, in each of the, the boxes, 25 to 75 percent percentiles. Um, and of course, there are a lot of things beyond just the weather in that airspace that can impact the flow rate. Obviously, upstream and downstream impacts are very important to be aware of. And that's why there's a spread. It's very natural to have that spread through there that is both weather related and non weather related in the airspace that we're measuring. Um, but with a large enough data set, we can see what the nominal value is. And if you click the button, please, Matt, we also have the sense, and I know uh, I think it was Kurt talked about earlier, there's really a sustainable rate through that airspace with that weather. And then there's an achievable rate. Um, maybe in a 15 minute time period, you can achieve these rates with these type of permeabilities. But if it's going to be a long persistent event, then the sustainable rate is what you are capable of doing over a long historical database. And so in our algorithms, we're really trying to 
translate permeability to a flow rate that may have different impacts on different time lengths of the impact. And I'll show that in a, again in a few minutes. Um, okay, if you could uh, go to the next slide, please, Matt. Um, and so the next step is everything I've shown you to this point has been the, the correlation of actual weather with actual flow rates. But we want to forecast that, of course. And so our model is using machine learning um, to input a number of different forecast um, models from just a simple extrapolation forecast, which is a big part of CUS and COSPA, to a number of time lagged her forecasts. Thanks, Matt. You're doing excellent here. Really appreciate that. Um, and then also LAMP and STREF are built into there. But we just don't take those models and throw them in there. There's a number of steps that have to happen first. One is the feature extraction process. And this is just not taking a permeability model and applying it over the weather forecast. It's also extracting very important features, looking at the gaps, the, the type of weather type. Is it cells? Is it a line? We have algorithms that are extracting those features from these models in each of the different forecast time. And that's what's called sort of the input layer here. And then from there, that is boiled down to this hidden layer. And I'm going to show you what that is in a second, um, some measure of the permeability. But again, we're, we're looking at more than just permeability. We're looking at the features of the weather forecast itself. And then the machine learning, as described in the paper that uh, you can see down there in the Journal of Air Transportation, is how the machine learning gets to forecasting the percentiles of what could be expected relative to permeability in the future, um, with 50th percentile being that black solid line that you could see, and the 20th and 80th percentile being the, the shaded region. And Jim, Jim Evans will get into that again in a few minutes. And then the model is trained with the actual weather using the machine learning on the forecast to give you that forecast information. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Here's an example. Um, so this is sort of that hidden layer displayed to you. We have the TFI permeability from a number of different input forecast products um, shown there. And obviously, as you can see with extrapolation, when there's no weather currently there or it's slightly off of the current region and moving in, you can see it has a weaker prediction of permeability, weaker being closer to 100, so less of an impact. And then each of the models which have, you know, dynamics built into them and are seeing storm growth um, are aligning pretty nicely as you go out to the 6th, 7th, 8th hour. Maybe a little more spread of that as we go out towards 12 hours. If you could click again, please, Matt. And so as we showed you earlier, here's our TFI permeability forecast, blue solid line, the shading to give you a sense of the uncertainty, which can also be a sense of how I might do risk assessment and risk management. And then the, the solid black line is the actual permeability value as computed from our model which I'll show you in a few seconds, of the true impact. And you can see, obviously, it's it's not as smooth as the forecast is because true weather does that, uh, but it is maintaining within the blue bounds of our forecasted uncertainty. And I think that's pretty important to know it, in terms of the 20th and 80th percentile that we are forecasting within. Um, and so there's a sense of what we're doing with the modeling. What I want to show you next, go ahead, Matt, if you could click, is a number of representative case days from 2019. So um, this is at decision point, right? There's a decision point during the day. These are 13 UTC forecasts. This is that ZNY1, which is really the ZOB ZNY transition area. And to give you a sense of what the spread can be and also what the weather forecast impacts might be. And this goes through the end of July. I have, I have another slide which should show you August, but I'm not going to do that. And you can get a sense of how many days are forecasted to be in the red, um, right? And as we've said in the past, uh, Jim Evans has said this many times, there's a handful of days that are very important and which what, some action must be taken, clearly represented here. But also beyond that, man, there's a lot of days that are in the yellow. And I think that often leads to the uncertainty, right? A yellow forecast says it could be a bad day or it might not be a bad day and trying to get that um, concept across that um, red days, you got to take action. Yellow days, you might want to think about it a little more, get a little more analysis, wait for the forecast update. I think July 4th is one of my favorite ones here. I know the traffic flow um, demand is probably a little bit less that day. You can see the median is well within the middle of the yellow and the bounds sort of touch on the reds and the greens. Um, and so that's a very difficult day, I think, to make decisions. Where if you go to like, I think someone earlier was talking about um, July 22nd or July 6th, um, clearly red impact days 
Um, and the uncertainty still remains mostly within the red and touches the, little, the yellow a little bit. Um, so those are days where really action is required. Um, and so I'll, I'll go to the last slide here and talk a little bit about the translation model. Um, that's in the middle here. We don't measure true routes. We don't use hexagons, um, but we do look at directional flows and we do use a concept of notional routes flying through a particular TFI region in a directional sense. When weather impacts a region, you're not always using your traditional routes that are there, um, and you do go off of that. And the model is using the route blockage algorithm developed under wrapped, for many of you who may know that, um, to look at the flow through each one of those notional routes and get a true sense of the permeability impact. The fact that it then translate well, as you saw in the box and whisker chart before, I think gives the model some real uh, strength in, in what it's doing and trying to represent permeability and flow rates. And there's also the, on the bottom of there, there's the encounter length and encounter intensity, which is trying to take into account for, um, I can handle some pretty bad weather for a very short period of time, fine. But I may also have some weather that's not in its own sense bad, but if I have to have a long impact through that weather, so the encounter length increases, then we want to represent that as a less likely region of which pilots are willing to flow to. And, and uh, I think I'll end there. Um, for those of you aware of WAF um, or the CWIN model, that is underneath all of this, this work, as well as the route blockage model under wrapped. Um, and it does at this point give you kind of a categorical impact of the first order permeability measure through the tool. And we'd like to really push towards showing flow rates, um, accounting for what is the decision that's trying to be made. So that's it for me. Okay, Mike, thanks for that. And um, thanks to all the uh, presenters here who have, have uh, been up the last hour. So uh, I guess we can move to like a question and answer session. I, I know we have a break coming up here uh, in a couple of minutes and another story back at, uh, but if there's a few questions, we can probably knock those out real fast and give everybody at least five minutes for an up and down. Bob, do you want to, uh, do you want to, uh Take a stroll through the, uh, the the chat and see what we got. Yeah. Hey, Matt. Yeah. Yeah. I've been looking looking through, and uh, as far as the uh, where we start, some of the questions have been uh, uh, asked and, and answered. Uh, there was one that Dan asked about hexagons versus octagons, and and uh, Dan uh, or, or David, um, is that answer sufficient there um, that they gave you? Yeah, no, that was uh, perfect. That was exactly what uh, what I was looking for. Thanks, guys. Okay, yeah, no, no, it's good. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so um, so I asked a question myself. You know, to Ken, or not a, really a question, but it's really a, a comment, and uh, about you know the, uh, the the practicality of uh, of rerouting. And uh, uh, let's see, uh, Ken had responded that. Uh, that you know, basically it's a proof of concept, and that um, he agrees that we have to address the other constraints and and, and mechanisms that are used in, in determining uh, routing. And uh, you know, Matt weighed in too with a, a comment that they were using this as a, a, a tool to assess the model performance. Um, so that, that that that's fine, Matt. Thanks. Uh, let me see, uh, Navid. Uh, Raise the uh, a comment uh, question in, in the mosaic model. He was asking about um, how do you estimate the new rates per region, and did you train the algorithm based on historical reductions in capacity for similar past convective patterns, or do you model the weather in line and see how many flights uh, might be impacted? And uh, and Chris Chris answered it. Uh, Naveed, is that uh, you? You good with that answer? Yeah, I think so. Thank you very much. So I had the secondary question that uh, since you're not training based on historical data and online modeling, do you calibrate based on like the miss uh, flights or like miss forecast for your future uh, modeling of the weather? Um, so I'm not sure if you're referring to the uh, whether permeability or the actual flight uh, capacity. But we haven't really talked about um, map values and, and monitor work parameter, but basically in terms of the sector 
original capacity uh, in terms of uh, you know a, a operation, if you will. Uh, we're, we're using water as a statement of the sector capacity, and then the weather impact is an adjustment downward to that map value for the sector. I'm not sure though if that answers your question. Yeah, definitely it answer. And so in your model, can it be that specific to the corner posts and the fixes around the airport? Yeah, I, I didn't really talk about how we come up with the the reroutes and it kind of relates to the previous question about the, the other model, um, uh, the other presentation. We actually have a, what we call a clearable routes network that is a, if you will, data mining approach to observing uh, actual flight paths that were both filed and flown. Um, since we since we do this data mining of routes that are filed and flown, uh, we basically are making the assumption that those are consistent with the uh, letters of agreement and the ERAM preferred routes and, and all those different kind of things. Um, and so we break that down into a similar um, node link model to what was being shown earlier. And then we're doing shortest path along that that node link model, but in this case, the node link model is consistent with ATC procedures. Um, so again, that's an answer to a little bit of a different question, but I think you know relates to some of what you're asking about. Yep, you answered. Thank you very much. Yep. And Ernie, I'm sorry, we were getting a lot of feedback. I was getting a lot of feedback through your your mic when it was open, so I I muted you. So uh, uh, th th there is one additional question that just came in from uh, Michael Split, but I'm not sure who it's directed to. So maybe Michael could give us a direction on that. Yeah, thank thanks, Matt. I was I was talking to a muted mic, and I was <laughs> I was going to bring up exactly what you said, but also I wanted to just say a quick hi to Chris. Uh, I hadn't heard his voice in a while, so it's good to good to hear him. Anyway, go ahead there, um, uh, Michael. Who was that question uh, directed to? That, that was to Michael Matthews. Okay. Um, he's got a lot of case sets there, and I was just curious about regional variation. You know, the Intermountain West versus the Northeast. Yeah, hi Mike. Um, so if you're talking about training the forecast models um, by regions, we do certainly have some difference between the regions, right? And some of that could be um, related to orientation um, and how that impacts permeability um, on directional flows. And um, I, I, you know, there's certainly some seasonal variation at this time. We haven't focused on that. Um, we've trained over a large data set over or a year or more from the forecast models and come up with the uncertainty that is independent of season. But I would agree it's, it's probably something that should also be considered in, in the, the machine learning model. That's it, Matt. All right, guys. Um, thanks, everybody. And it looks like we got about four minutes for an up and down before we start the 130 with Jim. Thanks, Roger, thanks. Roger that. So 130, be there or be square. Jim Evans is gonna is gonna knock our socks off. Okay. Uh, let me give you the intro of a thing. For, former was the next presenter. You know. Then after that, it's gonna be Jim. Okay. So our next yeah. presentation will be uh, integration new errands into the new tools. You know. Uh, Dean Former, who is working at the uh, CGH Technology right now as a Portfolio Manager for Unmanned Aircraft Systems and Commercial Airspace Transportation. Uh, I think interesting to uh, probably not undermine, but add, actually add the uh, complexity of future. You know, uh, this is really coming. Uh, we we heard about U.S. Uh, yesterday uh, with one dedicated hour, but uh, today I think this will be considered in the future. So with that, I will let uh, Jing to start uh, his presentation. All right. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, Matt, good to uh, talk with you again and to be with some of my old friends and to make some new friends uh, as well. So let me do a quick audio check. Can you hear me okay? Over. Five by five. 
Yes. All right. Please. All right. Very good. So we can uh, we can go on to the next uh, slide. And uh, judging by the conversation we've had so far today, I feel a little bit like I'm in a Monty Python sketch. And so and now for something completely different for those of you who might have been Monty Python fans. So uh, we've been talking about airline ops and all kinds of uh, current NAS operations, but uh, I'm going to focus a little bit differently here on that new entrance, put that in quotation marks, but they're not so new, these entrants now, uh, are they? So uh, drones or unmanned aircraft systems, uh, certainly rockets, balloons, supersonic, hypersonic flight have been around for a long time. But what is making them new to the NAS really is how many of these systems are moving from a uh, Department of Defense uh, um, you know, capability to uh, civilian capabilities, or they're moving from uh, national security applications to for-profit type of applications. Uh, they're moving from having relatively few operations in uh, a few number of locations to uh, a proliferation of operations in ever-expanding uh, areas, both uh, rural and in large metropolitan areas. Even space launch is moving from uh, the traditional coastal uh, uh, launch sites to more inland uh, type of uh, launch and uh, uh, re-entry uh, uh, operations. So uh, Matt, you can go to the next slide, please. So one of the things that that's doing as we're going through these transitional times is that this uh, evolution development cycle is really accelerating. It's, it's going from decades to years or even months. If we think back to, uh, you know, early aviation, we had uh, piston-driven airplanes with propellers, and we moved into the uh, turbine uh, uh, engine, and we have turbojet aircraft, and uh, we've gone from remote-controlled hobbyist-type uh, drones and DOD use of uh unmanned aircraft systems to um, very modern platforms. It'll be used for many, many different uh, uh, you know, commercial interests. Uh, our concept exploration and development to employ these new uh, technologies has accelerated across uh, the landscape. Um, you know, we've gone from uh, uh, regulated to uh, deregulated uh, aviation operations from hub and spoke, and now we're changing the commerce and commerce delivery aspect of what is going uh, uh, on in uh, our NAS uh, today. And so these, uh, this acceleration of concept exploration is really driving a whole new arena of research and development and, um, and concepts. Uh, and along with these concepts are emerging uh, business models. And sometimes it's the business models that are driving the concepts, and sometimes it's the concepts that are driving the business models, but they are rapidly being um, uh, developed. Uh, they've been uh, modified, and some of them have just been outright abandoned because uh, uh, to take advantage of this new technologies, or they've understood that this new technology, these new capabilities just are not scalable to support a viable uh, commercial uh, operation. Uh, certainly, as I mentioned, we're moving from rural and coastal locations to densely populated metro areas, uh, inland launch uh, and landing sites. Uh, new vertiports will be established in, uh, uh, in areas uh, around, uh, you know, big densely populated Syria's, um, cities, rather, uh, as well as out across the, um, uh, the whole geographic uh, US. Some of these will be uh, ad hoc, if you think about some of the uh, uh, package delivery uh, that will uh, initiate out of the back end of a, a semi truck that's parked in certain areas. Uh, and then there are those operations that would be uh, integrated into uh, you know, existing uh, airports or duly licensed airports and spaceports, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, one comment from a uh, contact I have uh, in the UAS world is a, that uh, advanced uh, air mobility, uh, no longer does the customer have to come to the airport, but the airport is coming to the customer. If you think about you know, long, long range concepts. But I know some of you are working on some of these uh, NASA uh, Aeronautical Research Institute uh, work groups and things like that. So maybe these aren't new concepts, but certainly things that we have to think about and incorporate into our R&D plans. 
And certainly public acceptance is key to uh, making all of this happen as well. Uh, we think of the FAA's new rule where, the, uh, where uh, drones can fly at night and fly over people as well. Next slide, Matt, thanks. Um, so what about these decision uh, support tools? The government utilizes internal efforts, other, other government like NASA, contractors, FFRDCs, and industry to develop these two different kinds of concepts and, and capabilities. That's a whole bunch of different people working on similar issues. Uh, everybody thinks that they have the best solution, right? So uh, there's, uh, there can be issues when you start bringing all that together to formulate a, a final plan. It's industry that really moves the quickest, has the most at stake with regards to uh, access, efficiency, and profitability. They, they, not only do they have skin in the game, they've got dollars in the game. They're trying to make this really um, a viable uh, uh, opportunity for them to uh, make some money. Um, the prototypes and decision support tools that are developed by industry um, in order to inform and validate the proofs of concept. The government, in uh, in a different vein is they're spending a lot of time studying what they should do. They want to look at the operational needs and technical requirements or whatever an end state might be. And industry and government together uh, will work very well in uh, increasing NAS access or allowing NAS access and uh, eventually operational efficiency, which has been the main discussion about what we talked to today. Certainly, uh, weather forecast, uh, delivery and visualiz visualization tools have to be changed, updated, or reinvented in a holistic way. All right. So, not that we're creating new tools, new new uh, panes of uh, uh, glass uh, in your operations area that you have to use a different tool, but that they are brought together in such a way that a single tool or system can uh, serve both legacy NAS users as well as um, new. Uh, NAS operators, or maybe it's these old operators behaving in new ways. We go to the next slide there, Matt. Thank you. Um, so incorporating these different prototypes and uh, DSTs into, into critical systems is really what's going to enable operational integration. And, and it's elements of, right? We don't put decision support tools into ERAM, so to speak, but the elements of that need to um, be in, included in critical systems like STARS and ERAM, which take years to update because the pipelines for enhancements are long and uh, different priorities can uh, require things to get shaken up a bit. Uh, the big challenge, of course, is to bring it all together, right? How do you bring different uh, research partners uh, together uh, in uh, certain areas, they are developing uh, with evolving standards, especially here in the unmanned aircraft uh, arena. There's varying assumptions uh, that are being uh, uh, taken by those participating in the research on what the end state should really look like. Um, scalability across uh, all NAS uh, operations. What works for one is not going to work for another. So, so how does it scale and serve uh, and serve all? And the timelines of need are, diff uh, are different. You know, uh, space operators, uh, they, they are months, sometimes, uh, you know, a year or better left of launch. They're making their uh, plans. Others are a couple of days ahead. Others are hours or even minutes ahead of time. So keeping FA and industry together in, in lockstep is really very critical. Uh, and uh, 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 agile development is really what needs to take place so that we can have faster, more elegant uh, integration solutions. Now at CGH, and I don't have any slides to talk about this, is we are uh, working on a, a NASA Small Business Innovation Research Project right now. It's called IARC. It's an integrated adaptive root capability. But we're building this uh, tool to serve uh, FAA needs individual operator needs, uh, airline dispatch needs, uh, space operator needs, uh, the UAS community for their unmanned uh, traffic management, uh, urban air mobility, advanced air mobility, um, really to have a one-stop shop where these uh, different entities can look for uh, pre-validated routes. They can then uh, uh, have those analyzed against um, weather um, uh, forecasts. Uh, and then uh, also um, uh, ensuring that this is scalable to, uh, to new users, uh, et cetera. We've been working very closely with, uh, with Ernie and Chad Wakefield and the flow evaluation team. We have a UAS stakeholder group that's been put together that we're talking to there uh, as well. 
So um, we're trying to do this uh, inside our own company. Uh, I implore you all to think uh, big thoughts when it comes to these uh, not so uh, new entrants. And with that, I think I'm about uh, 30 seconds over. Back to you, uh, Lee or Jim, whoever is taking over next. Well, Thank you. Uh, it's Jim's here. Uh, Lee, I guess we're ready to switch over. How do you want to uh, work? Uh, why don't we go to the end? Because I think this is an interesting topic. Okay. And we're going to have a discussion at the mm -hmm. end. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Uh, let me. Uh, the, ne the next part will be uh, Jim Evans. Uh, of course, uh, ev everybody knows Jim very well. Okay. Uh, but I do like to highlight his career. Uh, right now, he's a senior staff member in the Air Traffic Control System Group at uh, MIT uh, Lincoln Lab, and Jim really has a uh, uh, dis distinguished career serving uh, FAA and uh, ATM community. Uh, involved a lot with weather. W won so many uh, awards. Uh, just to name a few of his uh, uh, notable contribution that he led or uh, significantly contributed that, uh, you know, is well known. Uh, it's like a TDWR, uh, it was ITWS and uh, CIWS. With that, uh, I will uh, hand the uh, time to Jim right now. OK, thank you. Um, I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit about how do you get better decisions out? Uh, and en route convective weather. And, and let me just have a little perspective. Uh, when we were doing it was back in, in the mid 90s, um, suddenly there was a big escalation in delays. And why did that happen? Um, and I think if you think about it, which led to the S2K. And the thing that really distinguished that was turboprop, the turbos became regional jets. And now you had high altitude congestion that really didn't exist before. And to be frank, I think we've been, if you look back, we, we've been coping with this problem now for 20 years, and it's not easy. And one of the biggest problems is you don't really have very good forecasts at the lead times that you would like to go. So how are we going to do a good job or a better job? Got to have the next slide. Okay, so, you know, what we want to do is better utilize what was available, but don't increase ATC risk. And I would claim you need to think about tactical FCA throughput and how are you going to deal with the uncertainty in your forecast of, of, of what could be achieved. I mean, heavenly days, folks. There was an example earlier of TCA, and it missed a zillion events. So the, the risk is out there every day. So let's recognize we, we can't treat this as a deterministic product. You've got to think about how are you going to deal with uncertainty. And the next question is, we've had a lot of techniques. Let's ask about tactical throughput. Next slide. Uh, there was an earlier comment about controller workload. And I'm all for controller workload. If we look at the left-hand side of this slide, here's a, a typical uh, published activity uh, you know, model for fair weather workload where you conflict rate, okay, and that hinges on what the traffic flow is in a sector, and then you have these recurring events and you have to get planes in and out of a sector. Well, what happens when we put storms into play? Now, it's, it's stop and see, and I, to be frank, have found very few literature on this. Um, a controller, if there's sector, controller is gonna deal with convection in that sector, well, where will the storms be? And remember now, even with what is coming down the line, they're not putting forecasts up on the controller display. So controllers have to do that. They then have to anticipate what are the pilots going to do? And now you've got people off their normal routes. You better figure out how to resolve the conflicts. And by the way, if you're going to hand off at a different location because the normal location is blocked, you've got a coordination with an adjacent controller. So what does that mean when we talk about FCA convective weather capacity? Type of weather is important, not just fractional coverage. I mean, it doesn't make sense. If the squall line, you're just going to vector through a, a gap in the squall line, very different than if you have disorganized weather and you have to vector around a bunch of things. And the structure of the airspace is all important. And I have a huge problem with these generic models of, of, of route blockage. I, I just don't see how it can be true. Next slide. Okay. Um, 
there was a lot of studies done back around 2002 up to about 2006 out of the CWIS. And, and I strongly recommend uh, for people who are interested in this area, take a look at these two reports that uh, Mike Robinson, now at MITRE, was the lead on, because there's a lot of very interesting information that gives you a sense of what is the job, uh, what do people do tactically. Okay, so what, what did we find? There were two mechanisms. One is you were going to do proactive, efficient reroutes, and the other thing was keep routes open longer, overfly storms, reopen routes when the impact ends. If you go through those benefits studies of you find out echo tops were really important. Um, a very significant fraction is the ability to overfly storms. And for example, folks, I l looked at the echo tops for these two events we talked earlier down in Florida. Planes at 40,000 feet and above, which includes 737 Maxis, could have overflown a bunch of that convection. And if you don't recognize that opportunity, well, it, it's up to you. you. You're going to lose a factor of two on the average uh, um, in terms of route availability. Uh, the other thing that comes out is a hugely important internal thing to the ARTSIs. How does their communication and coordination work? When we did CWIS, we found it really made a huge difference if you treated the area supervisors as part of the team and gave them displays and training versus I only give the display to the TMU. Because if you don't accomplish a good job at the tactical level, I'm sorry. The strategic planning just doesn't, it, it's, it's going to be unfortunate. And so a key question, and I, I advise you to look through those reports at different artsies, how important is airspace structure in doing proactive, efficient routes? It's huge. It's huge. Next slide. Let's now talk about decision-making implications. And, and let me make a disclaimer. My, my uh, PhD thesis was in statistical decision theory. So when I see a, a output of a forecast with no indication about how much uncertainty, I have a problem going in. Next slide. OK, Mike showed this an example of the TFI. I wanted to highlight some things when I look at one of these uh, from the viewpoint as a statistical decision problem that folks you're going to face every day. Mike highlighted the medians, and then he showed the 20th and 80 percent tiles. Remember now, that blue shaded region is only 60 percent of the events. There's another 40 percent, 20 percent above and 20 percent below that you've got to think about. Um, now, what happens if you use the median, for example? Well, a sizable number of times, it's just inevitable. The weather events are going to be lower than you thought, and there's going to be underutilized capacity, and the customers in retrospect will say there was a lot of opportunity there we didn't take advantage of. Right, but if your uncertainty was there, what was going to be the answer? This uh, other side, and, and I think this is the one that is really important, what happens when the impacts are higher than the median? Then you have over-delivery of the demand, and FAA rightly should be unhappy. That's ATC risk. And now we're talking about holding patterns, and we're talking about diversions and other things. You can have ground stops, but we need to understand how will ATC risk be managed. Because if you don't, you'll then drive ATC to operate at a higher degree of of cutting back of traffic, and then the consequence will be much of the time you have underutilized capacity. Next slide. So how do we get to improving operational outcomes uh, for events that we think uh, we want to use an FCA? Uh, first thing is, uh, you know, we, we heard earlier, the command center is doing a good job of finding fair weather rates for all these FCAs that aren't impacted by convective weather. This is just a small fraction. I don't know. There must be a hundred. I mean, people create them on the fly, and and that finding fair weather rates seems to me pretty straightforward. And I'm glad to see. Yep, we we can do that. But what are we going to do when we're talking about convection? Next slide. Okay, I think there are, are four things. You, you, I offer for your consideration. 
first thing is let's not try to to make up good answers for so many different places. You, 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 we I don't see how you can understand your understanding what actually they do at that artsy. You you need to understand how much airspace do they have? What kind of actual root structures are they use as opposed to these generics? I heard nothing but generics. Um, for example, in rap, one of the big issues was we found in Chicago was where they have three departure routes right next to each other, even though each one of them individually was blocked, if you cut your traffic down by a factor of three but op created more operating space, they would get a third of the traffic through. That's something they do. You need to go there and watch what they're doing. Okay, I think you need to think about stratifying guidance by convective weather. I'm not sure it's possible, but I think it's certainly – we can, we hope to God we can find synoptic fronts, but then we get into this more sprinkly type stuff, and now we that impacts controller workload. And the other thing is you've got to look at echo tops. Oh my heavens! If you don't, you're missing many opportunities. You need a statistical uh, distribution of what you think is going to have. TFI does it, but you better make sure it's validated, not not just an off the cuff answer. And now we come to the ATC risk. Okay, so, you know, in San Francisco, we had the same issue arise with respect to GDPs and marine stratus burnoff. And we created a statistical forecast of burnoff, but the trouble is it didn't improve decision making and wasn't until Metron put together a tool that helped deal with the ATC risk underutilized capacity, and people came up with a better strategy. So I think that's one of the things you need to do, but only if you have a decent uh, validated probability model. The, the next question is, how can people do a better job tactically? Okay, you, you need to do maybe pre-planning for uh, possible diversions, uh, planning for quicker recovery. And I would strongly say People should look at what the Atlanta Artsy does. Atlanta doesn't bother, doesn't use, by and large, FCAs. They manage it tactically, but they're very good at getting people out of the sky and getting them back on board. And that's a question um, I say, operators, you've got to talk about how you think uh, risk can be managed. Are you up for having diversions and then timely recovery, or do you want to try to manage risk by just setting lower rates? That's a question for I think you need to explore um, on specific facilities. And certainly, I think we've heard you need to forecast capacity in the adjacent airspace because the root out is your big issue. And finally, I would say, can we not focus on a small number of FCAs where you, you think you're going to have a high benefit to cost ratio and really work with the requisite artsies and the customers to figure out how you're going to manage ATC risk. I, if you don't, I, I just don't see how you'll come to a, a very satisfactory answer. And hopefully, if you've done it a few places, you'll then see a better track to going forward. Next slide. So, this isn't going to be easy. I mean, I, I think we have at least at, at Lincoln Laboratory, been floundering around on this ever since 2008. It, it, it's 12, 13 years. And we still, it's, it's hard to make progress. So what do I th suggest? Focus on a small number of FCAs, understand the tactical capability, and, and think about it. This is going to be a statistical decision. How will the uncertainty be conveyed? How will the People have to make the operational decisions, learn how to use it, and how good is tactical risk management procedures and decisions we support. And I would say to uh, the people at the command center, I think Purdy needs to have a tactical uh, component. And by that I mean a tactical component where you look at how well are you doing tactically. Um, one of the biggest problems I see now, looking at the ATC system, is you've had a huge number of retirements, okay? And, and part of this goes back to Reagan uh, firing many controllers, and all the people who were then hired have now retired. 
And as a consequence, I think the the knowledge from the experienced people has walked out the door. So it's you you need to think about what is a sensible artsy specific training program and what kind of of post event analysis exists to help people learn uh, from past events. So there's some thoughts, um, and certainly I I would welcome discussion. And uh, you can take out my slide. I don't. It's it's fine. <laughs> I'd like to open the door up for questions, comments. Okay, great, great, Jim. Uh, uh, it's really a very in-depth thinking. <laughs> you know, I I, I really like uh, some of the aspect uh, that we uh, you know probably overlooked. Uh, the other things that you did bring us back on time. So we we have about twenty minutes, a little bit more than twenty minutes to discuss. I think uh, there are two levels of discussion. Of course, uh, the 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 questions among pan panelists themselves, uh, presenters themselves, and uh, also from the audience. Uh, I think I will ask the the first, uh, and also we'll we'll watch what questions will come in from the chat room. Okay, so the first question I want to ask uh, from uh, this is probably both for ATM and uh, I mean FAA and airlines. Is that uh, uh, would it be beneficial for FAA and airlines have a number of different capacity estimation DSTs available in operations, uh, knowing each of their uh, pros and cons, and uh, use them to support their decision making? You know, considering their uh, experience. You know, I I I, I do want to hear from. Uh, uh, FA and from uh, airlines separately on their take on this. Yeah, Leah, I'll uh, attempt to answer that from the FAA perspective. Um, Great. So it, it depends on you know what aspect you're looking at. It is uh, uh, if you're looking at the advanced plan with the party process, you know they have the time to. Look at different models. Look at different decision support tools. Um, you know they, they tend to be uh, not directly on the operational floor, but close enough to 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 know what's happening there. But if you start looking at decision support tools real time and making tactical decisions day of operation, uh, becomes very difficult. The more uh, tools you have to look at uh, in order to help you make your decision. Uh, and becomes a workload constraint from that standpoint. So it, it's while you have the benefit of multiple tools when you're doing planning, day of operation it becomes much more challenging. Uh, but one of the things we are attempting to do, and, and to Jim's uh, point about Purdy, um, we're looking for Purdy not to just be that next day plan or, or the previous, you know, previous day analysis for the next day. Uh, we're developing it into a, a continuous plan where it will continue to be updated throughout the day <clears throat> as new information becomes available, as um, <clears throat> we have time to have new analysis done, uh, as conditions change, as forecasts change, those type of things, so that it's not just a one look at 2.30 the afternoon before in developing the plan, but things can actually um, change that document or, or that plan to be a living plan going forward, which moves us from that strategic to the pre-tactical to the tactical standpoint uh, and being able to have that flexibility there. Um, that's just beginning just to be rolled out now. So we are working with industry and, and taking their input on how that will work um, and, and make sure that we're taking their considerations into that uh, process as well. Um, but that's the, the, the biggest challenge with, with to your original point on the decision support tools is at what point are they going to be used, who's going to be using them, and really just getting the glass space in front of the, the specialist that has to make the decision, how many things can they actually look at to help them make the best decision for the system? Okay, all right. How about airlines, uh, Tim and uh, Bill? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge for us um, in American would would really just be the training aspect to pe to get a large group of people not only trained enough to be familiar with it, but also just, just to maintain proficiency. And so 
that's that's part of the challenge is that we have with too many tools, um, especially even if they're a prototype. And so we tend to focus on um, a fewer set of tools and to try to go deeper and to main, pre, maintain proficiency. But, you know, this is where, you know, I think um, the value of groups like CDM, where you have a collaboration of different airspace operators, you know, people from academic, academia and control and ATC personnel together, helping to evaluate some of these is, is, is another approach to uh, vetting some of these. Okay, but but also from today's talk, uh, I I sense the especially from Ernie's uh, summary. Uh, currently, there seems to be a lack of the basic baseline tools that uh, you know give FAA and airlines consistent view. You know, of course, uh, you know in a lot of tools. If you notice, we can draw, easily draw polygons or lines, but the reality is that uh, like uh, thunderstorm cells, they are. In models, they are reflected as pixels, but when once airline pilots see, they are just the area, you know, not having a regular shape, right? So there are gaps, there are, there are things in between, there are opportunities to be utilized, uh, but of course there are danger too, to be avoided too. So uh, it's really not a easy answer, <laughs> I would say, you know, but uh, it, it also seems to be a need to to come to a point that that we can hopefully get some baseline, you know, more improved or enhance the baseline tools that give us a better improved position uh, compared to currently what we have. Hey Lee, did you want to hit the other questions in the in the chat? Uh, starting with uh, Michael. Michael Splits. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yes. I said, uh, Michael was asking, uh, had a, a concern about uh, convection turbulence impact on the usage of echo tops and the traffic management uh, decisions. I, I think, Mike, you're asking, is there a concern about convection turbulence impact um, on the use of the echo tops? Well, I'm, I'm, right? I'm specifically talking about above convective uh, tops, right? You know, the, the, uh, turbulence potentially above the standard anvil and overshooting top in terms of, you know, do people, have, you know, I, I've sat through several of Bob Sharman's <laughs> presentations and it makes you not want to fly anywhere in terms of turbulence and convection. So I just wonder if that permeates other communities that I'd rather not fly over those echo tops. Um, well, let me, let me make a comment and, and, and Mike uh, Robin and, and, and Mike Matthews can, can pipe in. Um, in the at least in the case of the Lincoln model, uh, we looked at what <laughs> where planes fly. And keep in mind now, if one plane were to fly over something and encountered turbulence, you'll tend to see that the subsequent planes aren't going to either fly over that because um, th there'll be a pie rep. Um, but you know, basically, what people have learned in, in the many studies, and it's always fun to go out and do yet another one of typically when people are fly or more than the flight altitude is more than 5,000 feet above the echo tops, the radar echo tops, you, you generally see the traffic flow pretty, pretty uniformly. Now there's another whole side of it, which you could bring up, which is, well, yes, but there, maybe the tops are growing and, and that's why, you know, most of the algorithms that uh, are looking at growing echo tops, um, we'll consider that. But one of the things, if you just go out and look at Echo Tops fields in convection, including these Florida events, by the way, you will see that those regions of lower tops tend to be consistent. You know, they're not, you don't suddenly see bright red spots pop up in, the, in a, a sea of, of lower ones, but you have to look at some data fields to decide that for yourself. So the short answer People have looked empirically at where pilots will fly in, in coming to that solution. And you can, in fact, look at a lot of data cases as well. Uh, this, is, this is Mike Matthews. I just wanted to add on to that. Um, I've looked at this a lot. And there's 
a certain sense, I think, by pilots and those avoiding the weather that um, if the tops are regionally, say, you know, 35,000 feet, um, they'll fly over them. But if the regional area has sort of high tops that are spiking up, um, indicative of the, the region is the potential to be very convective and have that turbulence that you're talking about, Mike, over anywhere, then they'll tend to avoid it. So it's sort of one of the things that has that little bit of a caveat to it that um, tops are not that tall, no, not extremely tall, but they're, you know, medium range height and they're pretty uniform, then they'll go over it. But um, the, you know, they'll probably avoid it if there's strong cells within the storm region. Thanks, Mike. Um, there was a comment too from Mike Robinson and Mike, I'll, I'll, I'll tee it up and then uh, once you pick it up from here, but I think you're saying uh, Jacksonville seems like a nice place to focus. Yeah, well, I was just I was just keying off of what Jim's recommendation was is, you know, focus someplace and really dig into it. And obviously there's a lot of uh, a lot of value to that. And not only the traffic trends, but Jack 7 has obviously been a very important FCA and AFP region. Tons of traffic, tons of impact, tons of weather and tons of variety in the weather. So it's just, uh, you know, with, you know, if you, if you want to do this, you know, in the nearer term, New York in the Northeast is still an area where the demand may not really be there. And, you know, it may be coming, who knows, but certainly Florida is already pegged. It's already been getting hammered. And Jack 7 is that area of the airspace has certainly become a really important um, part of the mass. So that, I, I just wanted to throw that out there and probably 80% of the people on the call already had their minds there. So. Yeah, and Mike, the, the Jack 7 is going to be our focal. Uh, we, we've got uh, our next NCF coming up the second week of May. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time with industry having that discussion about our strategies with the Jack 7. Uh, breaking it up into multiple lines and what those lines look like and working with the facilities. Uh, so there'll be a lot of discussion um, because we do see the value in uh, utilizing some of these new strategies in that area. And, and Jack 7 just is, is the logical place to start. Awesome. Glad to hear that, Greg. Thanks. OK, uh, great. Uh, then go further down the list of questions and comments. Uh, there's a comment uh, from uh, Nathan uh, regarding Echo Tops, United Air Airlines, and I suspect the other majors as well. Instruct pilots to avoid overflight of thunderstorms as a matter of policy, unless if not practical attempt to overfly sails by that, by at least uh, 5,000 feet. Does anyone want to address that? Is, is, is this just a comment or a question? Uh, just just a comment. I mm -hmm. think uh, the discussion of echo tops is um, is interesting mm -hmm. uh, to me. Echo tops are really uh, you need to look at the broader synoptic environment, right? Mm -hmm. Early season low topped convection is a much different animal than say the uh, higher tops associated with a large organized MCS. So if I'm you know in the Florida event, I'm trying to traverse the uh, outer portions of the MCS. Uh, you know, that's a different threat environment than, say, a low topped uh, non severe line, you know, uh, in January or February. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that the overall environment in which the thunderstorms are are occurring and how organized they are has a lot to do with whether or not those echo tops are something that I'm comfortable overflying uh, mm -hmm. or planning to overfly. Right. OK, great. Hey, so, Lee. OK, Lee, go ahead. Sorry, sorry this is Matt. I, I just want to I want to pile on to this whole uh, overflight and echo tops conversation, which uh, which I personally find fascinating at one point in time. But I'll be doggone if I can find it now. There there were there were explicit instructions in, I believe, an advisory circular that 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 gave guidance on how how much above a thunderstorm top you had to. Uh, overfly it, um, a, a severe thunderstorm top, and it was related to the ambient wind field in, a, at that altitude. And it was a, a, a multiplier, and I forget what it is right now, but it was so many, so many thousand feet per 10 knots of wind speed in the ambient environment. And 
it, it basically meant that in, in a in a calm environment, in theory, you didn't have to overfly by as much as you would have to in an environment where there was a, a fair amount of wind speed in there. Uh, I, I would like to echo Michael Split's comment uh, that if you if you go to the AMS annual meeting and you listen to the the turbulence. Um, talks of of the leading experts in this area of Bob Sharman and and um, and his collaborator in Australia, whose name completely escapes me right now. Todd but, Lane. Yeah, Todd Lane. Thank you, Matthias. You know, at the end of the day, I I, I would never want to overfly a thunderstorm for fear of having the, the the hammer of Thor coming up from underneath me and and hitting me square in the rear end. Um, so so the, and convectively induced turbulence. Sit does does not seem to necessarily at this point, or our, our understanding of it doesn't seem to lend itself to nice, tidy, uh, concise rules of thumb. It, it's like one of those things that that can it can bite you from a long way away, whether it be horizontal, vertically, or horizontally. So, um, so j just just really interesting and difficult problem. Um, for us all to deal with. No question, just a just a, hey, a comment. Hey, Matt, it's Mike, if I can, Robinson, really quick, and I'll, I'll tee up my, my old colleague, Mike Matthews. Um, all this discussion is interesting, but independently arrived at years ago with its statistical classifier, the WAF model uncovered independently that relationship of 5,000 foot separation from equitops as the main weather avoidance field driver. So it's it's in the WAF model that's driving TFI. So there there's a good connection that's grounded all the way back to um, the behaviors and, and activities of dispatchers and pilots. And, and Mike, Mike, Emma, please correct me if you need to. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, CWIM and WAF represent that pretty well. I always just throw in the caveat there that um, when the original models were developed and still true to this day, the abundance of the flights are typically in that 33 to 36 or so thousand foot altitude. And there was not a lot of flights in the model at, say, 40,000 feet. Um, and what I did was at one point stratified that a little bit. And you could see that even flights at, you know, at 40,000 feet, but that 5,000 foot difference might not be the right number um, because they're at 40,000 feet seeing the storm growth that's coming up below them and, and things like that. So it, it's, it's not as simple, I think, as we've sort of interpreted it. Um, it certainly is there, and the Florida cases are very common in that, right, where they're going down the panhandle, staying above some of the storms. But the the idea that you always are at 5,000 feet willing to fly over, no, a 40,000-foot top or a 38,000-foot top, you're not willing to fly over. So you have to be really careful in, in interpretation of that. Um, but again, you know, it is, I think, a lot has to do with the texture of the weather from an echo... Uh, uh, tech, echo tops image as well as what pilots perceive the situation for the day. If I'm a pilot, I get a, a you know a, a, a review in the morning, and I know this e region is going to be bad. Then I'm probably not going to fly over thunderstorms. But on a different day, where there's a lot of level three, level four weather at low altitude, but the f tops are not getting that tall, I probably am more willing to do that. So it, it does need, I think, a little more study. <laughs> Um, but the general, you know, statistics from CUM were, were certainly true, but it, I think it applies to a certain altitude range. Okay, great. Uh, next, I, I still have two questions, but I want to ask in reverse order. Uh, I know Jason have a question, but I want to ask uh, the comments raised by Debbie uh, <coughs> Korolewski, asking about it would be good, great to see the FCA, FCA throughput rate chart published on the OIS page. I think we'll probably get, get a quick answer from FA. Is that because of policy or access or uncertainty issue that uh, this information cannot be published? No, not necessarily a policy issue or anything else. Those were, as Kurt briefed, um, those have just been developed. So it's still experimental, really basically. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry? Those are uh, experimental. That, is that what you are? Well, to. yeah, they're still being developed, and uh, but there's no reason why what, once we get a little bit more um, confirmation of, of their uh, validity uh, mm. that we can't post it on there. We do have some uh, challenges because the OIS page is part of TFMS, so there's different rules that we have to apply. It's not just updating the web page, it's uh, part of the system. Uh, but I can take that suggestion to Kurt uh, and, you know, just like we do with 
the airport rates and, and the different configurations there, uh, it should not be a problem. Uh, it's okay. just a matter of solidifying those numbers and uh, and finding a place to put them. Okay, great. Thank you, Greg. Okay, now now Jason has an uh, interesting uh, suggestion. Is there interest from the panelists in pulling toast together into a single convective weather system? Uh, what would you like it to have? Okay, uh, I think this is really interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's a big question. I I just I kind of asked that when I think it was the Greg was talking, and mm -hmm. you know there are some comments made that you know there's a lot of tools out there, and you know our tools you know kind of being made for the the meteorologist, are they being made for the operators themselves, the controllers directly? And you know there's a lot of products out there when it comes to convective weather as well. I just uh, was kind of interested in this group's thoughts on you know. Would it make sense to kind of you know pull things together into a more of a consolidated system? So, if person A is looking at you know the ABC model, and someone else is looking at the TCXYZ tool, you know that they're they're all kind of using the same platform. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know if the group had any thoughts on that, and then if they did, you know what would you like to have that you don't have today? Okay, I think it will require considerable coordination and effort, but I would probably uh, ask Ernie to address this. I think uh, his effort uh, pulling together all the uh, uh, state of the art approach into a, uh, on the paper is the first step. Okay, Ernie, you agree? So, so w would you like to address this uh, question? Wait, say the question one more time. Um, was it about uh, platforms? Yeah, so basically we uh, presented so many uh, different approaches and tools, right, uh, today. Uh, so the question is about, is there interest from the panelists to, to importing these two tools together into a single uh, convective yeah. weather system? Yeah, I mean, that's that's really what we're looking at. I mean, when you look at some of the recommendations from the FET group, I mean, you know, we we thought that there there isn't a, there isn't a decision to port tool really uh, that's uh, really available for anyone to use. And you know, we we run a little risk though because I think that Tim Nizek said it best earlier is that you know you can only have so many tools right, right that you can use at a time. You know, so many screens in your at your at your back end, right? And so you know, how do you best take the technology that you're trying to solve? And put that into some of the tools that exist you have now, so that you're not having to add, you know, another screen. And and that's always been the issue with a lot of these problems is that is that um, you end up with like there's a lot of tools and a lot of uh, prototypes and things that are great out there, but you know, then how do you get them integrated into the tool set that you have now, and, and or into the future builds of things that we're using? That's that's really the bigger problem, I think. Not sure if that answered the question or not. <laughs> No, I definitely appreciate what you're saying, I, and then I certainly like agree with it. I, I, uh, I guess I've kind of I'm on the sweat team, and I'm also in uh, in the next gen program under uh, Sir Randy Bass's group, uh, looking at input convective weather and uh, some of those the efforts that we're kind of talking about. Maybe is you know, do we how do we start to modernize the convective weather products? You know, so for the NAS, you know, and I and I, I agree with what you're saying and trying to streamline things and. Uh, uh, would certainly be a step in the right direction. So um, we may want to talk offline. Yeah, it's okay. almost like you need a, an integration team, right? That that looks at all the things that are out there and figures out the best way of integrating, you know, the, the best technology into what's out, you know, what the tools are that we're using. I mean, that seems to be the missing piece, at least from my end. I mean, I see a lot of stuff with, with some of the work that we've done with some of the other, uh, you know, vendors out there with some, you know, work this summer that we're doing with Pathfinder and things like that. You, you can see that the, the, uh, the IT folks are eager to build a lot of things in. And, and when we ask for capabilities, they put them in so fast for us. And we wish, of course, that that was not a prototype, that it was a real world thing that we could all use. And, and um, you know, sometimes it's not that easy to get things put in that you really want, I guess is my, my point. <laughs> but yeah, we can talk about it anytime. Okay, great. Uh, so basically my, my take is really, if there is a will, uh, there must be, be a way to be fig figured out to how, how to do it. The point is that if that's going to help save, uh, you know, strategic planning for like hours or save technical adjustment, you know, two or three minutes, it's still very worthwhile considering how many uh, flight delays or cancellation it it can save. Okay, uh, I think hey, for the sake really. Uh, hey, go ahead. I'm just curious on that question from Jason. That's a good question. I, I, I wanted to sort of hear maybe from Jim Evans or 
Mike Matthews, uh, how they, what their thoughts on that question about a single convective weather system. What, did you guys have an opinion about that? Well, let me, yeah, I, I, I have grave problems um, with that idea. Um, and, and it's because it, you know, we have to sometimes relate the weather forecast, for example, to what decisions are you trying to make? And is it well tuned to this one or to that one? I mean, TCF was, had, a, had a particular reason it was put together, and that was to stop the fighting about what the meteorologist said on the S SPT. But, you know, and part of the other trouble I think that you face now is um, encapsulated by the TFI, which is you've got AI algorithms going in there trying to tra use all these things simultaneously um, to accomplish certain things. And you know, if you if you had a different task, the AI algorithms would probably tell you there's a different weighting you'd want to use. So that's one of the troubles. If you just look at what's going on in a large scale in terms of the technology, it's much more. We'll take an AI algorithm and try to train train it to make to help support certain decisions. And I well may well find the weighting is rather different for other decisions. So that's not very helpful. Um, I'm, I'm sure to you who say, oh, I just want to have one generic does everything well, convection forecast, but I, I, I have some major questions about that. So uh, there's that side. And the other side is really the coupling, if you like, between system management and the weather community. I mean, FET and, to my knowledge, WET don't necessarily have very many meetings together. and you know, we ended up, I think, and I'm, I'm going to give you the example of San Francisco. It was never, never land because you you had Metron put together a nice tool on the back end. But, gee, that's not the job of aviation weather. And you ended up, I'm going to tell you, with with stuff going out in the field that's never been retrained for a bunch of years. And I'm sorry, I live in San Francisco Bay Area. Um Global climate change has kicked in. The old statistics that go date back 20 years are no longer valid, I would claim. And the question is, whose job is this? Is it aviation weather's job? Is it system management's of the TFM community? I mean, how do you have a meaningful collaboration to, to address specific problems? We, I, I'm, I'm asking the question. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, very well. I, I, I'm afraid we have to stop here. Okay, I, I think uh, Matt and, and uh, Macias will have, 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 have other things uh, planned uh, after 2.30. So, uh, Matt, Matthias, I give time back to you. And again, thank all the panelists, uh, uh, presenters today. It, it was a great uh, session today. Thank you. Lee, thank you very much, and uh, and and kudos back to you and and Ernie for uh, for herding the cats, getting such great presentation, great presenters, giving great presentations, uh, and still keeping us within shouting distance of on timeness. So um, so congratulations and thank you very much, folks. We're going to take another. Um, Matthias, what do you? Well, I, I'm thinking that we could probably start at. 235 Eastern and still do what we need to do. Would would you agree? And if so, do we we still do a 10 minute break here? I think a 10 minute break would make sense because uh, we also need to empty our brain a little bit from the discussion that we just had and settle down to start talking organizational matters. Yeah, yeah, we're we're going to go into the really really interesting. I mean, more I mean interesting stuff uh, in this next session, and we want everybody to stick around. So, in order to facilitate that, let's take a 10 minute break. We'll come back at 14:35 Eastern, and um. And um, uh, I hope you will all stick around because I, I think we have some important conversation to have about about how, how how we take these just fascinating conversations with this one of a kind mix of people in the room and 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 do the right thing with it. So 235, it's now eight minutes or seven minutes from now, so I'm not quite 10, but a little more than five.
Ready, set, go.